The next item of business is debate on motion 17342 in the name of John Finney on stage one of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. May I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on John Finney to speak to and move the motion for up to 10 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be opening today's debate on the general principles of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. I'd like to begin with a, a series of thanks to the convener and members of the Equality and Human Rights Committee for their diligent and measured consideration of the bill, evident throughout all the evidence sessions which I had the pleasure of attending. Um, a special thanks to the committee's clerking team for their work as well. Also parliamentary staff and those out with the parliament who facilitated the committee's many external evidence-taking visits. Thanks also to all the witnesses who gave evidence and everyone who contributed comment from the outset to this process. Of course, I welcome the 75% support my consultation drew in the backing of members from all the Parliament's parties. Thanks also to many colleagues from all parties in the Parliament for their support and advice as my bill has progressed from the start of the Members' Bills process. I'm also grateful to the Scottish Government for their support of my bill and to the Children's Minister, Marie Todd, for her support as my Members' Bill has progressed and I look forward to her contribution this afternoon. Big thanks to Nick Thorthorne of the Parliament's Non-Governmental Bills Unit and to Katrina McCallum from the Office of the Solicitor of the Scottish Parliament for, for their work and to my office manager Stephen Dane who has been tirelessly leading uh, the work in my office on this bill. Beside officer, I, I was originally approached shortly after the last election in June 2016 by the Coalition of Children's Charities and that was Bernardo Scotland, NSPCC, Children First, and the Children and Young People's Commissioner's Office to consider taking forward a member's bill on a simple proposal, that children should have the same legal protection from assault as adults do. And I'm immensely grateful for their ongoing support and encouragement since then. I have to say this was not my first foray into this topic. Working with Bernardo's towards the end of the last session, I tried to squeeze the issue in as an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill 2015 but the convener of the Justice Committee at that time ruled it out with the scope of the bill. I am in hindsight, however, grateful for that decision because this has allowed our parliament, indeed wider civic society, an opportunity over the last few years to broaden discussions about the rights of our children and young people in Scotland. Indeed, I know many members from across the chamber are looking forward to supporting the Scottish Government incorporating the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law. Indeed, that was recommendation 16 of the Equality and Human Rights, Getting Rights Right, Human Rights in the Scottish Parliament report in November of last year. And I warmly welcome that decision of the committee. I believe that this period of debate and reflection has strengthened my proposals and indeed highlighted a lack of awareness around the issue on many occasions, I've been contacted or even encountered people who were surprised at the need for the bill, many believing that physical punishment of children had been prohibited a long time ago. Of course, it wasn't. And this important issue has not been looked at for almost 16 years, since the last weeks of the first session back in 2003. And perhaps the few members who were there for that debate will hopefully agree that now is the time. My intention in bringing forward this bill is to bring clarity to the law by removing the defence of reasonable chastisement, sometimes referred to as justifiable assault, and to send a clear message that the physical punishment of children, um, uh, the physical punishment of children is not acceptable. The growing body of international evidence shows the physical punishment of children is harmful to their development and not an effective means of discipline. Professor Sir Michael Marmot of University College London, in the foreword to the report Equally Protected, published in 2015 by the charities I've mentioned, stated unequivocally, and I quote here, the international evidence could not be any clearer. Physical punishment has the potential to damage children and carries the risk of escalation into physical abuse. It's now time for action. On the issue of physical punishment, Scotland is out of step with Europe. Um, and increasingly the world. There's an urgent need for Scotland and the rest of the UK to comply with the international human rights law and prohibit all forms of physical punishment. 
Dr. Anya Hellman, a, a very uh, um, compelling witness to the committee, also of University College London, told the committee that the evidence from this research, and I quote here, shows very clearly that such punishment has the potential to harm children. And importantly, that it's not effective as a parenting strategy because it tends to increase problem behavior in children's socio-emotional socio difficulties, I beg your pardon. That is important, as these problem behaviors in children do not disappear at the age 16. This is a problem that is stored up and damages our future society. I'd like to quote from uh, the briefing members have received, and I'm, I'm very grateful to all the organizations who have provided these briefings, which as ever in our debates are extremely helpful. Uh, if only I could find the one I'm looking for now, that'd be even more helpful. The, um, it was from Dr. Tasman Knight of the Faculty of Public Health in Scotland. And I quote here, childhood physical punishment is linked to adult aggression and antisocial behavior, including aggression and sexual violence within intimate partner relationships. We often in Scotland talk about zero tolerance for domestic abuse and violence, but we allow the use of physical punishment for children. This sends a message to our children that hitting someone is a way of resolving a dispute or if you don't like their behavior. I believe that this bill is a vital step in ensuring that we see the necessary change in our culture as a society, much in the way that the smoking ban was as a necessary legislative step in making Scotland a healthier place to live. Opinion polls, as now, have asked different questions showing a mix of views, with some polls being against the bill. But I say again, the consultation to this specific proposal had 75% in favour. The committee, Equality and Human Rights Committee also heard that in none of the countries which now prohibit physical punishment of children was public opinion with the legislative change at the time of the change. I firmly believe that as with the smoking ban, we will see public opinion change over time. As Bruce Adamson, Scotland's Children and Young People's Commissioner, told the committee, and I quote here, you need legislation to drive the cultural change. We know that to be true. In that regard, this issue could be seen in the same way as seatbelts in cars, drink driving, and smoking in pubs. On such issues, you need to lead with the legislation in order to deliver the cultural change. It's worth noting uh, I believe the opinions of young people in Scotland, uh, which are perhaps more in line with the aims of the bill. The Scottish Youth Parliament, which we often refer to in this parliament for the, the, the good work it does, and their Lead the Way manifesto, they consulted uh, uh, their members and had 72,744 responses from 12 to 25 year olds. That's an astonishing figure. 82% agreed that all physical assault against children should be illegal. Feedback from the 260 pupils who participated in the Equalities Human Rights Committee meeting in a box to gather evidence from children and young people showed that 66 of them supported the bill. My, aim, my bill aims to bring Scotland into line with what appears to be becoming the international standard in 54 countries. From the very first country in the world, Sweden, in 1979, to Ireland in 2015. And I'd like to thank Gillian Van Toonhout, the former Irish senator who secured equal protection for the children of the Irish public for our knowledge and support throughout this process. Nepal in 2018 and this year, the state of Jersey. So that's the direction of travel, uh, presiding officer. I'm sure all parties will agree that we should work together to ensure that Scotland becomes the best country in the world for children to grow up in. And I strongly believe that if, the, if passed, my will would play a vital part in making that aim come to pass. I'm pleased to note the comments from the Minister that the Scottish Government is working closely with relevant organisations to work on the next steps to ensure the bill, should it be passed, it progresses satisfactorily. I'd like to take the last opportunity to repeat my thanks to the committee for its support for the principles of the bill, and I move that the Parliament agrees the general principles of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Thank you. I now call on Ruth McGuire to speak on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. For up to eight minutes, please. 
Presiding officer, I'm proud to speak in this debate on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. And I'd like to start by giving a heartfelt thanks to our diligent and professional clerking team who are an example to us all. This bill has dominated our work programme over the last few months. It's an important bill for children and for families and could impact on a huge number of people in Scotland. We knew as a committee we needed to hear directly from those affected. And so we set out an ambitious programme of engagement. We went to meet parents and grandparents in Pollock Shields, in Sight Hill and in Midlothian. We visited young people in Kirkcaldy at the YMCA Juniors Club. To reach the parents and children we couldn't get to, we developed meeting in a box so community groups could send us their views. We received responses covering over 300 individuals. Finally, we held an external meeting and a day of fact-finding in Portree on Sky. We couldn't have heard from all these people without the help of a number of teams from around the Parliament. On behalf of all the committee, I would like to thank our outreach team and the engagement unit for helping us hear from so many voices. Our thanks to the members of staff who travelled to portray with us, official report, media, web and social media, and a particular mention to security staff who travelled through a snowstorm to support our meeting. We appreciated having them there. But of course, our biggest thanks go to those who informed our scrutiny. Over 450 people, many of them individuals, took the time to write to us with their views. I know that many of them have concerns about this bill and the possible impact it might have on family life. I say to those people that as a committee, we have heard those concerns. We met people who shared with us their fears about the bill and we listened to their views. But we heard too that many parents today don't smack their children and Scottish society is moving that way any event. And we need legislation and support to help parents find alternative approaches to discipline. We also heard from children and young people who told us their thoughts. Our particular thanks go to the children of Portree High School and Bunskov Gaelic for Stree, who shared their opinions intelligently and freely. The preparation you put in ahead of our visit was most impressive. Tapalaiver son falcha hochriel hurorn on the Portree. Since the extension of its remit in 2016, this committee has, wherever possible, taken a human rights-based approach to its work. That approach informs our work with children and young people. A human rights approach recognises children have the right to participate, to be listened to and to have their views recognised and respected. This has been central to our work on this bill, which after all has children at its core. This is a bill about rights about the rights children have to be free from violence in every setting, including the home. Home should be a place of safety and comfort where a child is nurtured. It's extraordinary that home is the one place ch children are allowed to be hit. And it's only children, not partners or pets. All of us have the right for our private and family life to be respected. Much of the evidence we heard questioned whether there was a conflict between these rights between the right of a child to be free from violence and the right of parents to raise children as they believe best. We were reassured by the many witnesses who told us the right to family life does not include the right to use physical punishment. The Scottish Human Rights Commission said the European Court of Human Rights has determined several times that the right to family life is not interfered with by prohibiting physical punishment of a child. They went on to say, that physical punishment clearly interferes with a child's right to dignity. Because of their physical and mental immaturity, children are entitled to and require more, not less protection from violence than adults do. And we, as adults and parliamentarians, have a duty to uphold the rights of all vulnerable people. In our visits and engagement, we met with parents who told us they had been smacked and they were fine or that they smacked their children with no ill effect. And we heard that there's a marked difference between violence against children and a loving smack. Nevertheless, the evidence we heard from experts and academics is that physical punishment does have negative effects. These range from depression and mental health issues to increased tendency to use violence themselves. And as Jane Callaghan, Professor of Child Wellbeing and Protection at Stirling University told us, it makes no difference whether these smacks were administered in love or in anger. The effect is the same. In the course of our evidence taking, we heard many times that parents need to smack children in certain situations. 
Maybe the child is reaching for something hot or about to run into the road. But Dr Louise Hill from the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland put it best when she said to us, as a parent of young children, if they run into the road, my immediate response is to hold them. I get hold of my children and I keep them safe. Presiding officer, this is what the bill attempts to do. It shows children and young people that as a society, as a parliament, we want to keep them safe. It puts their rights at the centre of our policy making and aims to support families in doing so. In conclusion, presiding officer, the majority of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee supports the general principles of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. I now call Marie Todd for up to eight minutes, please, Minister. Presiding Officer, I am pleased to be speaking today for the Scottish Government on this bill. As the Minister for Children and Young People, I see this bill as forming a key part of our work to ensure that Scotland is the best place in the world to grow up. Let me first of all thank John Finney and his team for their hard work and dedication on progressing this bill. And I also thank Ruth Maguire and the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for their careful consideration of the bill and their reasoned balanced report. The Scottish Government supports the removal of the reasonable chastisement defence. I welcome the Committee's support in the report for the general principles of the Bill. There's a strong rationale for our shared position. The name of the defence, reasonable chastisement, is antiquated. At the heart of the current defence is the concept that it can sometimes be reasonable to strike a child. That is completely at odds with our aim for Scotland to be the best place in the world for children to grow up. We can contribute to that aim by providing children with the same legal protection from assault as adults have, the principle at the heart of this bill. Scotland can be at the forefront of providing this protection for children in the UK. Removal of the defence will help to deliver the best possible outcomes for children in Scotland. It will assist them in growing up, feeling loved, safe and respected so that they can realise their full potential. Removing a defence is consistent with international treaties, best practice in human rights and with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. In addition, removing the defence reflects the growing body of international evidence which shows that physical punishment of children is both harmful and ineffective. Certainly. Liz Smith. Uh, I'm listening very carefully to what the Minister is saying. Um, if we are listening, has she given any consideration to the very strong views of the majority of parents in Scotland who find that this bill is unworkable and probably unenforceable? Marie Todd. When asked, over 90% of parents in Scotland believed that children should have the same um, protection against assault as adults do. Certainly. Oliver Mundell. I wondered if she could set out how many people in Scotland thought that it was appropriate to criminalise parents uh, for these activities and if she would set out once a defence is removed, under what circumstances parents would be prosecuted. Marie Todd. So I, I'll, I'll happily tackle that point in my summing up. We've been over this at committee and you're regurgitating the same, the same, the same arguments just now. I'm going to make progress um, at the moment. By removing the current defence, this bill will provide helpful clarity to parents and carers about the law. The committee comments on this in paragraphs one to one. Certainly. Oliver um, Mundell. I thank uh, the Minister for giving way, but if she wants to talk about clarity, is she able to set out one example, just one example, of where someone would be uh, criminalised uh, for an action that currently would be uh, not criminal because the defence exists? Marie so, Todd. So let me be clear about this. This change in legislation does not create a new offence. What it does, so the offence is already there, the offence is already assault, and there is a defence in law against that. What this does is remove the possibility of the defence. When considering a, a particular case, 
the prosecutors will take into account all of the things that they do currently. There may be an alternative defence, like self-defence. They will take into account the criminal intent. They will take into account the age of the child. There are a number of things which will be considered. I cannot preempt a particular situation and make a decision now on who will be criminalised. What I can assure you, what I can assure you, is that in Scotland, our intention is not to criminalise parents. Our intention is to is to provide early support using a getting it right for every child approach which we have been using for many years continuing to use that to recognize the situations where parents need support and to put into support not to criminalize this is the last intervention. I'll I take. can allow you a little extra time, Minister. Liz Smith. C could I ask the Minister to explain with clarity, as I think it is her uh, role to do, as to why she believes that the current law is a bad law? Marie Todd. So, let me be absolutely clear. The Scottish Government does not think it is acceptable to use physical punishment on children. We believe that children should have the same protection in law as adults do. By removing the current defence, the bill will provide helpful clarity to parents and carers about the law. The committee comments on this in paragraphs 121 to 128 of its report. The minority statement in the report says in paragraph 280 that the committee has spent too little time listening to legal experts but there has actually been significant evidence by legal bodies. For example, the Law Society of Scotland supplementary written submission to the committee says, the bill as proposed would introduce clarity of the law on what amounts to assault on children as far as children and adults are concerned. Assaults on children would not be justified. Children would therefore be afforded the same protection as currently available to adults. Whether prosecution for an assault on a child results would follow a decision by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service as to prosecution being appropriate in the public interest. The Society goes on to say, if the bill is passed, there is a need to ensure that there is effective communication of the change to all involved. That has to seek effective ways to ensure that those groups representing protected characteristics are fully considered. The committee also makes this point in the report. As drafted, section two of the bill provides that the Scottish ministers must take such steps as they consider appropriate to promote public awareness and understanding about the effect of section one. If the bill is enacted with section two forming part of it, we will of course comply with section two. The Scottish Government has formed an implementation group which is considering what will be required if this bill is enacted by Parliament. The group's work included what would need to be done on public awareness and the Scottish Government will continue to provide support for parents and organisations. But we are not telling parents how to parent. What we will do is continue to provide support for parents so that they can decide for themselves the best way to take care of their children. We know, I'm a mum of three teenagers, we know that parenting is a tough job. We know that children can be challenging and wonderful, sometimes at exactly the same time. Our approach to parenting support will continue to reflect the day-to-day -day challenges that parents face. And we will continue to provide practical, realistic advice that parents can turn to for help with these challenges. Awareness raising does have cost implications. The stage one report asks about cost implications of the bill generally. The Scottish Government will consult with members of our implementation group and following that will write to the committee before stage two. The committee noted in paragraph 241 the divergence on costs for public awareness raising and there are a variety of views on exactly what should be done on awareness raising. It would be possible to raise awareness by taking steps, for example, putting material on websites which have low cost implications. And I note the oral evidence through the committee from Gillian Van Turnout on 21st March that in Ireland their allocated budget was zero. So they didn't have any awareness raising or campaigning in relation to the change of the, of the law. 
We did raise, discuss the awareness raising and campaign work with our partners on the implementation group, and we'll take account of the points made by the committee, particularly on points um, made in the, in the um, report. Have I, the committee also made points on restraint. The Scottish Government is in agreement with the conclusion by the committee in paragraph 62 of its report that we do not agree that physical punishment is required to protect children from harm. We conclude that the bill as drafted will not change a parent or carer's ability to restrain a child to keep him or her from harm. We've noted the comment in paragraph 68 of the report that restraint in care settings is an area that we believe requires much wider scrutiny. And although we do not think this bill is the vehicle for that scrutiny, we agree that this bill is not the right vehicle, but we recognise the importance of the issue of restraint in care settings. Mary Fee raised this in committee, and I'm very happy to meet with her at any time to discuss it further. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish Government supports removing the defence of reasonable chastisement. We welcome the committee's report. I believe that this is the right thing as well as a rights thing. And I ask members to support the general principles of the bill in the stage one vote later today. Thank you. I now call Oliver Mundell for seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. When I was elected in 2016, I did not imagine I would be standing up in this chamber to oppose a bill calling for the equal protection of children from assault. The fundamental problem is that this bill does more harm than good, and it doesn't live up to its name. It's below the quality of legislation the people of Scotland should rightly expect here, here. from its parliament. Here, here. And in my view, however well-meaning, it represents an assault on family life. Let me be clear, violence against children is wrong. On that point, I'd hope we could all agree. However, that's where I depart company from other members who speak enthusiastically in support of this proposal. Because when it comes to the proportionality of subjecting good parents to criminalization yep. and the suggestion that it is justified and reasonable for the state to intervene in family life where child welfare is not at risk, I cannot agree. To pass legislation restricting parental rights and discretion would be bad enough. But to pass this particular legislation that lacks any clarity as to the threshold for the involvement of the police or indeed prosecution is sheer madness. I will do. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful for the member taking intervention. Has the member read the explanatory note in relation to the public interest test? And does he understand that that is not changing? And he was present when the police and social work joined, joined together, knowing their work, said that this would bring welcome clarity. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank uh, the member for that intervention. I look forward to the Lord Advocate coming to the committee on the 6th of June to explain why, in its supplementary written evidence, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service recognise that there is a question where mild force is used by parents. And I want to understand who will be responsible for taking the decision uh, to, to prosecute parents and under what circumstances. I also wonder whether or not it will fall to individual police officers uh, to decide whether or not to investigate families and on what basis and when uh, they will do so. I've not heard any of those answers uh, so far. And I think uh, that that's why this represents bad law. And I think it will lead to more confusion. Um, that was something pointed out by Gary McAteer, a leading uh, criminal lawyer who the committee didn't have time uh, to, to hear from. Um, I think uh, that this leaves us open to potential legal challenge. Uh, there are other members uh, other witnesses who came before the committee who did recognise that this would create grey areas uh, and problems because the law of assault is quite wide. I won't. Uh, as legislators, surely our first duty is to ensure that legislation is workable. Yep. My concern here is this. When I asked the Scottish Government's legal team if they thought it would be helpful to provide clarity for parents, as we do in other legislation and areas of criminal law where we choose to legislate in statute, to modernise and fundamentally alter common law provisions by setting out for all to see in black and white in statute the tests one would expect to be met if the force, uh, use of force by parents was going to constitute an assault. They responded by saying that you would end up with something close to what you already have. Exactly. 
The question, therefore, is what is the point of this legislation and why uh, has the current government not sought to do anything to address this seemingly burning issue in over a decade in power? I'd be particularly grateful, um, as I've already tried to ask, if the minister or the member in charge of the bill could set out in what circumstances parents who currently rely on the existing defence will be prosecuted if this bill passes unamended. Today, yep. Yep. John Finney. I say again, the member is inferring that this is some new change of regime as regards investigation and prosecution. Nothing, absolutely nothing is changing with regard to that. If the member had trouble to read the explanatory note accompanying this bill and listen to the evidence that was presented. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. I, I think that comment from the member is quite frankly insulting. And I think it makes a fundamental error on a point of law. And that is that in this country, where a defence exists, it is considered by the Procurator Fiscal when deciding whether or not to take forward a prosecution. So the likelihood of a defence succeeding makes a difference in whether or not prosecutors choose to prosecute. And we've heard from uh, legal experts, um, including Pamela Ferguson at the University of Dundee. Uh, we've heard from Michael Sheridan, uh, one of the leading criminal law agents in Scotland, that this change, whilst not creating a new criminal offence, will criminalise behaviour that is currently lawful. And that means that parents will be prosecuted, uh, maybe not in great droves, uh, but parents will be prosecuted and subject to police investigation in circumstances where they currently wouldn't be. And as I've already pointed to, even the Crown Office, who could be charitably said to have been reluctant to engage with this bill to date, recognise that challenges will arise when physical contact is of an extremely minor or trivial nature. Indeed, it's almost impossible to know when the Crown Office or Lord Advocate would consider the public interest test to be met. It's even more difficult to establish when matters would be considered sufficiently serious for the police to investigate, and it's not clear at all who will make that decision. As a parliamentarian, I have deep misgivings about passing legislation in an area as sensitive and controversial as this, which gives such wide discretion to individual police officers and prosecutors. When it comes to legislating in statute to remove centuries-old common law provisions, I believe there is a duty on this parliament to provide absolute clarity and to set out our intentions, not simply to make big bold claims and pass the responsibility for taking difficult and legally complex decisions onto others. The failure in this bill to set out that clarity is an abdication of, res an abdication of responsibility. And the bill as currently drafted is so imprecise that it fails to improve on the current state of affairs. What's more, uh, the, we've heard uh, from uh, some confusion uh, from, indeed from, from witnesses before the committee. Uh, for clarity, the law of assault doesn't require a forceful act and there need not be substantial uh, violence or any injury. Indeed, it can include a slap, tapping someone on the back, the members or even a gesture, placing a person in a state of fear, even if there's no actual physical contact. That seems a very broad category of behaviour to turn the focus uh, onto with regards to parents. And it seems odd to me when witnesses such as the Children's Commissioner have said that they cannot foresee uh, small situations in which small physical interventions would end up in court when the law of assault seems to suggest different. Uh, this is the problem with this whole uh, legislation. We haven't got into the legal detail. We've spent far longer having an ideological debate about whether it's right or wrong to hit people, about whether or not it says you can hit your children in the Bible. These are not the right questions to be asking We've not investigated this bill properly. Um, and I think, quite frankly, presiding officer, it seems extremely odd to legislate, to criminalise uh, people for an action and then hope that it doesn't happen. Thank you. We'll call Mary Fee for seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity today to participate in this stage one debate on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. And can, can I say at, at the outset, just because legislation is centuries old, it doesn't mean it's right. And we as parliamentarians and politicians have a, a duty and an obligation to be progressive and to, to lead change. And this is what this piece of legislation will do. And as a member of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, can I thank the individuals and organisations who have submitted evidence on this legislation? 
And during our evidence sessions, including one in Sky, the committee heard robust contributions from a range of experts. And it is on our evidence sessions and much of what is in the report that I will focus on today. And this piece of legislation seeks to give equal protection from assault by prohibiting the physical punishment of children by parents and caregivers. And the purpose, as we have already heard, is to abolish the defence of reasonable chastisement. And parents and others caring for children can currently use this defence if they are facing a prosecution for assaulting a child. But let me be clear, this legislation is not about criminalising parents or criminalising carers. It's about giving children the same protection in the law that adults currently have. Certainly. Oliver Mundell. Uh, so thank you for giving the member for giving way. I, was the member able to give a guarantee today then that no parents will be prosecuted um, if after the law changes? Mary Fee. Can I thank Oliver Mundell for that intervention? And I think um, the intervention that he made on the minister when she was making her contribution, I think she more than adequately covered um, that area. But what I will say um, to, to, to Oliver Mundell, one thing that I have, have struggled with, um, for people that say that um, we, sh we shouldn't be removing this defence of, of reasonable chastisement, if any one of us were walking down the road and we saw a carer out with an adult who had a learning disability, and we saw that adult hitting that person with a, a learning disability, I would hope that we would all be absolutely horrified. That adult, that adult has protection and our children should have the same protection. Very, very briefly. Liz Smith. I'm grateful to Mary Fee taking an intervention. I couldn't agree more with that point. But does she recognise that there is a fundamental difference in law between assault, assault and reasonable chastisement? Will she recognise that point? Mary Fee. Can I once again thank, thank Liz Smith for that um, intervention? Any kind of assault is assault. You can't, you can't justify it by saying, well, it was reasonable to, to hit. If you strike another person, you are assaulting them. The bill seeks to drive cultural change in Scotland to discourage the use of physical punishment. And evidence that we heard in committee demonstrated that physical punishment is harmful to children. We consistently heard that it is detrimental to the well-being of a child and is likely to lead to an increase in negative outcomes. And the evidence we heard strongly showed that parents, children and family support services are best served by adopting methods that do not involve physical punishment. And by removing this defence, we are protecting children from harm, whilst also committing firmly to safeguarding children's human rights. And let's be clear, we are a parliament that is a guarantor of human rights. Once again, we have an obligation to protect the human rights of children. Martin Canavan from Aberlour argued, there naturally exists an imbalance of power in adult-child relationships. And as a result, it is critical that children are provided with as much protection in law as possible. And this legislation will help Scotland to meet part of our international human rights obligations under the UNCRC. And Article 19 of the UNCRC states that countries must take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect children from all forms of violence from any person caring from them, for them. And Scottish Labour is fully committed to the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law. And this legislation is a step towards progressing that commitment. And we heard a range of views both for and against the, the principles of the bill. Submissions from organisations that work with and support children fully support the aims of this bill. And I do understand the concerns that many parents will have regarding the bill. Indeed, the majority of individuals who made submissions did not support the principles of the bill. There were concerns that suggested that banning smacking could overwhelm police and social workers, that loving parents should not be criminalised, and that the ban would turn thousands of parents into potential criminals overnight. Individuals stated that smacking is not child abuse and that there is a clear difference between child abuse and loving parental discipline. 
And I also understand concerns raised from parents, arguing that this bill could lead to an increase in criminalisation for parents smacking their children. The bill does not make changes to policing or prosecution procedures or practices. And the committee has been assured by Police Scotland that they would continue to take a view as to whether there is enough evidence to charge a person and the prosecution authorities would decide whether there is sufficient evidence to support a case. An international experience from countries that have already addressed the use of physical punishment suggests that prosecutions would not notably increase following implementation. Ireland unanimously repealed its common law defence of reasonable chastisement in 2015. And the committee took evidence from Gillian Van Turnout, a former Irish senator, who introduced the amendment that led to the prohibition of corporal punishment in Ireland. And she said, since the implementation of the law, Ireland has not seen a dramatic increase in prosecution of parents. And a key factor in this bill is its aim to facilitate a cultural change which protects children from violence. The public education strategy will, will seek to work in the same way that the ban on smoking in public places and legislation requiring the use of seatbelts has done, not to criminalise, but to encourage positive change. And finally, presiding officer, I do want to touch on the issue of restraint in care settings. And I have seen firsthand the use of restraint and the distressing impact it can have on children and young people. And we heard moving evidence from Amy Beth Mia, a care experienced young person that saw physical restraint as a violent and degrading experience. And she said that the bill raises a grey area when a child is removed from their family home to be placed in care. The state then becomes the child's corporate parent and is suddenly okay for the state to restrain the child and to act in an almost assault-like manner that breaches human rights. And I welcome the commitments that will be made by the government to look further at the issue of restraint in care and, and education settings. And I welcome the Minister's comments in, in her contribution today. And I am happy to meet with her to discuss further the issue of restraint. And by giving children equal protection from assault, we are protecting children and safeguarding children's human rights. And through an effective public edu education strategy, this bill will aim not to criminalise, but to create a, public, a positive culture of change. And today is the first step in that journey to create a more positive culture. And Scotland is not the only country that, that, that's on that journey. In his contribution, John Finney spoke of other countries who have either introduced or are consulting on the introduction of similar legislation. And at stage two, I am sure that a number of amendments will be lodged to not only pro provide the clarity that many desire, but also to strengthen the bill. And for these reasons, I would urge all members to support John Finney's Members' Bill. Thank you. Ross Greer, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm delighted to speak on behalf of the Scottish Greens today in support of our colleague John Finney's bill to give children equal protection from assault. I know how hard John, his team and the wider equal protection campaign have worked and I'm delighted to see the bill's progress towards this stage one vote. Children and young people in Scotland have rights, something that we widely recognise. But as the evidence gathered during this process has shown, our laws are not yet in a position to adequately protect those rights. In 1989, the United Nations proposed a treaty which would lay out the rights of children, as was recognised in the original Universal Declaration of Human Rights some decades earlier. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was signed by the, the Government of the United Kingdom on the 19th of April 1990 and ratified by the UK Parliament in December of the following year. The preamble to the Convention on the Rights of the Child affirms that precisely because of their physical and mental immaturity, children need special safeguards, including appropriate legal protections. Children are afforded human rights just as any adult is, and we recognise that they require bespoke rights just as other vulnerable groups do. Article 19 of the UNCRC is unequivocal. State parties shall take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence. Article 37 requires protection from torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, reflecting the European Convention on Human Rights and other international treaties. Other articles reinforce the child's right to physical integrity, and protection of their human dignity. 
Now, repeatedly, the UN's Committee on the Rights of the Child has highlighted the continued failings of the UK in this respect and reiterated that the law as it stands in the constituent parts of the UK is in breach of this international treaty. The age of criminal responsibility would be another example of this, which is currently under consideration by this Parliament. It's all well and good for these rights to be enshrined at the international level, but the UK as a dualist system when it comes to international law has to give domestic effect to these rights. For a long time, we've treated international human rights as an afterthought. We've treated these rights as something not really applicable to us and presumed that we were in compliance anyway. But over the last several years, things have gotten far worse. The UK's approach to human rights has turned in many cases from an afterthought to one of outright attack and hostility. Just last week, the UK Secretary, for, uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions launched a blistering and utterly unfounded attack on the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Philip Aston, for his report on the UK. This comes after similar responses by the UK government to reports by the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which found grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights going on right now in the UK. Here in Scotland, we must be better. We can be better. We must take seriously our international commitment to human rights. Today, we have an opportunity to press forward with that commitment. Since we signed the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child, we have failed to uphold its obligations. The last time this Parliament considered the matter, it tinkered around the edges, hoping, I think, that this would satisfy the UN Committee. But of course it didn't, because the UK, including Scotland, was not willing to take the necessary steps, steps which I firmly believe we are ready to take now. While this bill is a clear step forward, towards recognising the rights of young people in Scotland, there is the broader issue of our human rights obligations and living up to them. Like other members, I was delighted when the Scottish Government announced that it would support and lead on incorporating the UNCRC fully into Scots law. I welcome the consultation the Government have published in the last week to do just that. The credit for this really needs to go to the Scottish Youth Parliament, whose campaigning for children and young people's rights is an example for others across these islands and globally. And again, I hope this will be a step which all parties can agree on, allowing us to fulfil our ambition to make Scotland a human rights leader and the best country in the world for children to grow up in. The work being undertaken by the new Human Rights Task Force will be a vital part of this. I sincerely hope the government seeks to move forward without undue delay with the recommendations of the advisory group on human rights that issued a report in December. Human rights must have a strong domestic basis in Scotland, lest we leave ourselves vulnerable to the disgraceful attacks on basic rights that we've seen characterise the current Westminster government. To do that, we must both legislate on specific rights issues, as the Equal Protection Bill does, and seek to better incorporate international human rights law into Scots law. I'd like to conclude, presiding officer, by quoting Ian Campbell, who was the husband of Grace Campbell. Mrs Campbell, as some members might be aware, led the court case more than a decade before I was born, which saw the end of physical punishment in our schools. Mr Campbell, explaining Grace's philosophy, said, you just don't hit children. It's that simple. And, presiding officer, it really is that simple, which is why, on a personal level, I've been deeply frustrated by some, a minority, who have used the faith that I share with them as an excuse to oppose this bill. And it's why I'm very proud of the churches and other faith groups who have strongly supported this bill, because I believe not just as a matter of political conviction, but as a matter of deeply held personal faith, that children have the same inalienable human rights that we all have. Children, children and young people are rights holders in and of themselves. They have the right to be protected from us all. I urge all members to support the bill this evening and tell the children of Scotland that they are unbeatable. Thank you. Alex Crowell Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to start by offering my sincere thanks to John Finney and with it the full-throated support of the Liberal Democrat benches tonight for his legislation. I'm actually quite emotional. Um, members will know that I have spent my entire career prior to being elected to this place in children's rights. Over two decades, I fought alongside colleagues in Children First, Abelara, Bernardo's and others to end the physical punishment of children in this country. We have had setbacks and failure, but were it not for their grit and persistence, we would not be here today. And it was my great privilege to address them at a rally outside the parliament this morning. 
On one occasion during that campaign 10 years ago, I appeared on Radio Scotland to debate physical punishment with an organisation opposed to change. Immediately after the programme finished, I got a call from my dad. He said, you know, I'm really proud of you for helping to lead this campaign. I only ever hit you once. You were two years old, your mum was in hospital having your sister, and you wouldn't eat your dinner. You had a proper meltdown, so I slapped your legs. You turned around and you bit me in the face. He never hit me or my siblings again. Presiding officer, I cannot remember a more deliberative process in a stage one proceedings of any bill that I have helped to scrutinize. We've heard evidence from academics, parenting experts, religious groups, and criminal justice stakeholders. I want to thank each of them and the parliamentary staff of our committee in the conduct of this process. The overwhelming conclusion that I believe that Parliament should arrive at tonight from the evidence that we received at stage one is that we should join the ranks of the 54 countries to have extended the same protection to children in their societies as those enjoyed by adults. It is wholly wrong that children should be the only people in our society subject to assault without legal impediment. There is an international imperative for us to pass this bill as well. The United Nations persistently point out that we are not meeting our commitments either to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Convention Against Torture. We are one of the last remaining countries in the whole of the Council of Europe not to have brought about this change. Put simply, presiding officer, if we are truly to become the best country in the world to grow up, then we will forever fail in that aim for as long as we allow the physical punishment of our children. We will forever fail in our aim also to eradicate domestic violence in the home while we legally or culturally sanction any kind of violence in our society. And we shall fail in efforts to reduce violence in our streets in so long as we allow parents to teach children that violence is an acceptable tool of either sanction or anger. Because, presiding officer, we all know that children learn by watching adults. Dr. Lucy Reynolds from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health offered our committee empirical evidence to this reality in Bandura's Bobo Doll, Doll experiment. This demonstrated that children shown a film of an adult picking up a toy mallet and whacking a clown doll in a room full of toys did likewise when they entered the room, whereas children who hadn't been shown the film did not. She concluded in evidence to our committee that as she said, children learn by mimicry and if you hit children, you are teaching them to expect either to dominate or be dominated through physical violence. Pres uh, presiding officer, my father realized that the second I bit him. Crucially, John McKenzie from Police Scotland giving evidence to the committee backed that view up when he told us there appears to be a link between violence in the home and violence in wider society. I am not blind to the controversy this policy shift represents, but I have satisfied myself that not one of those arguments deployed holds water. We have heard from the Conservatives this afternoon that this bill amounts to an assault on the rights of parents. I will from Mr Fraser. Myrtle Fraser. I'm very grateful to Mr Cohampton for taking the intervention. I listened with great interest to what he had to say. But would you accept that parents will discipline their children in a number of ways? They might put them on a naughty step if they're very young, they might exclude them from watching television or playing particular games, or they might ground them. None of these things would be acceptable if done to an adult. In fact, that would amount to domestic abuse if done in an adult setting. So why are our children different from adults in this respect? Alex Cole Hamilton. I, I, I think Murdo Fraser rather trivialises this if he equates something like a YouTube ban to the physical assault of another human being. Yeah. I'm afraid I just don't accept that what, in any way whatsoever. We have heard from the Conservatives that this bill amounts to an assault on parents' rights, but nowhere, nowhere, presiding officer, in treaties either international or domestic, is there a right for you to hit your children. We heard the concerns of many who talked about legions of parents being march through the courts for normal parenting behaviour, as they describe it. But they have no answer to the reality that in countries like New Zealand or Ireland, who are comparable culturally to ourselves, they have virtually no additional prosecutions. Like the smoking ban, I need to make some progress. Like, the, I, I need to make some progress. You didn't take mine.
design. Like the smoking ban, such a change is not a designed to criminalise, but rather affect a cultural change. And I was gratified that Police Scotland confirmed that they would only bring such charges if it were in the public interest to do so. However, the most persistent argument that we came up against as in terms of arguments against a change in the law can be described as the idea of protective punishment. It was used just on Radio Scotland this very morning, that if your child runs out into traffic or moves to put their hand in a fire, you need to retain the right to smack them so they can learn not to do it again. Can I reassure those people that none of the 54 countries to have ended physical punishment of children, none of them have experienced an uptick in child deaths on the road, nor have they, their paediatrics burns units seen a spike in admissions. This aside, the most compelling answer to their argument lies in the consideration of mental capacity. My friend, former Irish Senator Gillian Van Turnhout, delivering this legislation in Ireland, told our committee the running out into traffic argument was used in Ireland. Someone on the radio helpfully gave the example, however, of her grandmother who has Alzheimer's. She said that she would not think to hit her grandmother if she ran out into traffic, so why would we choose to hit someone of similar cognitive ability but who was just smaller? Arla was basically saying saying you can hit someone as long as they are smaller than you. I agree with Gillian and every proponent of John Finney's bill, and I say once again, it is wholly wrong that the smallest people in our society should be the only ones that you can raise a lawful hand to, and I support his legislation. We move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please. Angela Constance, followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I have to confess that I do find it pleasing that it is a, an ex-police officer that is bringing this legislation forward in Parliament because it tackles uh, head-on many of the lazy stereotypes about those who serve or who have served in our justice system. And Mr Finney is to be commended because while I support his bill unreservedly, it is nonetheless a very emotive subject. And it's difficult to discuss because right away you tap into at least one of three things. And firstly, uh, as referred to earlier, there is that school of opinion, that school of thought will say that I was smacked, scalped, hammered or leathered, insert whatever language you may choose to use and it never harmed me. And it is not my place to tell someone that their own personal testimony is wrong. And we know that some folk are undoubtedly uh, more resilient than others. But it is fair and accurate to point to a body of evidence that says overall physical punishment is more harmful than helpful. And at the end of the day, it doesn't actually work. And secondly, we will also encounter adults who will recount their own childhood experience that may well have been in keeping with the times in which they grew up mm -hmm. and they do so with pain. And it's not always associated with the severity of the physical punishment that they experienced, but it was how it made them feel. And I visited um, a day centre not that long ago for older people and one of the ladies, um, she was given very forthright opinions, as is her right, uh, about how some young folk uh, need to be brought into line. And this resulted uh, in one of uh, the gentlemen making one of the most emotional pleas I've ever heard in my life about how no child should ever be hit. And the third issue that we bump up against that makes this difficult to discuss is actually parents. And parents of today, uh, with all our worries and their angst about doing the right thing and whether or not we will be judged by those who are meant to be supporting us in doing what at the end of the day is the most important job that we will ever have. Yeah. And we know, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to decline uh, today, uh, Ms Smith, because I'm not going to take interventions because, like good parenting, it's important to remain calm. So <laughs> I want to um, point to the fact that today's parents are least likely to smack or to even find it useful. And in my experience, most parents don't want to smack their children. And if they do, they do it because they are at the end of the rope and then they instantly regret it. Yet, as citizens and as a society, we still find it hard to find the best and the simplest ways to support parents. And a number of years ago, I was at the shops, and this will be a scene that will be familiar to many, but there was a young woman 
she was shouting at her wee one, she was yanking him up with his arm. It was really difficult to watch because I thought his arm could come out of its socket. And I had this real anxiety about what I should do, if anything. Me, as the local MSP, a former social worker, and to boot, uh, I was an education minister at the time. And I didn't want to ignore the distress of this mum or a wee one, but neither did I want to be intrusive or heavy-handed. So I started rummaging about my handbag, found a sweetie, sidled up to the mum and asked her if it would help if I gave the wee one this sweetie. And it was just enough to interrupt the flow. The wee one uh, glowered at me and then gobbled the sweetie. And all I said to her at the end of the day is, it's no easy, is it? And this was a young woman who had a toddler, but she also had a newborn and she was absolutely knackered. And I, for one, would not support this bill if I thought for one minute it would increase the prospects of mums like this young woman being criminalised. And while I accept all countries and jurisdictions are different, there is considerable comfort to be taken that 54 countries have travelled this road before us and that the UK is, no thank you, and that the UK is only one of four European countries that have yet to travel this terrain. So we're not exactly blazing a trail here. And although this bill is not in itself a silver bullet, I believe it will help us have a better discussion about parents hitting their kids and therefore a better response to supporting parents. And if we remind ourselves about the detail of the need to be compliant with the UNCRC and the wholesale approach of Article 19.1 that calls on governments to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect a child. Uh, this surely uh, is merely, this bill, an incremental extension of GERFECT. And we should be helping to support that behaviour change that is already happening and the law does need to be clearer eh, and children having the same protection under the law as adults is clear. And by removing eh, justifiable assault, reasonable chastisement as a defence, we do not change prosecution or child protection practice. There has been oodles of evidence in front of the committee eh, that has demonstrated that. So Mr Finney's bill is not just seeking in my view, to do the right thing, he has actually found uh, the right way to do it. Thank you, President Officer. Annie Wells, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Throughout stage one, I have been clear on my concerns about the Children Equal Protection from Assault Bill. None of us in the Chamber would ever condone violence against a child, and neither would the public. Yet we are debating a bill a proposed bill that would see many loving parents criminalised. It is absolutely key to this debate today that we make a distinction between reasonable chastisement from parents and disproportionate punishment or assault, something that is recognised by current law. Whilst members may disagree with me on that point, there is no way of escaping the fact that the bill will be practically unworkable. In 2002, the, Just, the Justice Committee at the time dismissed the proposal on the grounds it would be unworkable, unenforceable, and that there was no evidence to suggest it would reduce the harm to children. This time round, the bill has been under the watch of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, of which I am a member. As Oliver Mundell and I said in our minority statement, as well as not being convinced of parent support for this bill, we do not believe it will provide legal clarity and in its current drafted form may be open to future legal challenge. In our view, it will create a small but not insignificant grey area where the use or perceived potential use of physical force to protect a child's safety or for the purposes of restraint by parents may be misconstrued or reported to the police as assault. The fact is that in practice, the police would have to, at the very least, instigate some form of investigation into the circumstances around extremely minor cases. These situations will no doubt bring stress and angst to many and caring, loving and caring parents. No, I'll keep this as calm as I can, as well as same as um, the, the member earlier said. These situations will no doubt bring stress and angst to many loving and caring parents. 
how frequently such referrals would be made to the Procurator Fiscal and whether these would lead to full-blown criminal trials is still unknown. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal did state that it is quite possible that reports to the police would rise. Police Scotland also stated that the bill would increase reporting of crimes with potential cost and resource implications. Many of the written submissions to the committee did raise concerns that the bill would increase pressure on services like police, courts and social work. Significantly, the Lord Advocate has not yet provided oral evidence before the committee, and given that this bill would mean the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service had to make determinations on whether to criminalise parents, I believe that is vitally important, and I am pleased that this will be taking place next week. As we mark 20 years of devolution with the creation of the Scottish Parliament, we should be thinking about how we pass good legislation not legislation that would potentially come under scrutiny for years to come if passed. We must pass legislation that is clear and uncomplicated and it must be workable. I'd like to raise a final point during this debate in relation to the government's right to interfere with family life. Polling has shown that parents in Scotland do not support this bill. A YouGov survey in 2017 found that 54 54% of Scots said smacking should not be banned, with only 25% of people in support of the ban. A month after the bill was introduced, a panel-based survey found that only 30% of people supported the prohibition on smacking, with more than half, 53% believing it should be allowed. Yes. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful uh, to the member giving way. Does she not also recognise that other surveys Mr Cole Hamilton, could you speak to the microphone, Sorry, please? My apologies, Presiding Officer. Does she not recognise that other surveys have shown that actually parents do support the equalisation of protection from assault of children? But she, does she also reckon that we as a parliament should always follow public opinion, whatever it says, or should we sometimes try to lead it? Annie Wells. What I think I am trying to say here is that we need to pass good legislation and legislation that's workable and enforceable. So many constituents have come to me over the last few months concerned about the risks the bill would pose to loving and caring parents. Parents are concerned that despite the bill's best intentions, it represents an intrusion into family life. One individual stated it, it suggests the government is above parents who, if this bill is passed, will have decision-making decision power in the home. Another stated it's only parents that know their child best and how to approach the sometimes very difficult task of parenting. As with named persons legislation, this bill implies that parents do not know what's best for their children and that parents cannot be trusted to make the distinction between reasonable chastisement and assault. The reality of the situation is that legislation already rightly makes this distinction. If meaningful work is to be done on eradicating violence against children, we should not divert the focus of police and prosecutors and bring it on to good and loving parents who choose, often only very occasionally, to use mild physical intervention to discipline their own child, children. Presiding officer, this bill represents a heavy-handed approach which, despite its best intentions, may in fact distract from our responsibility to, to protect children. The law currently already protects children from violence and it works well. The reality is that a majority of Scottish people are against this bill as it would criminalise loving parents. We should listen to these concerns, avoid the temptation to virtue signal and focus on passing good legislation. This is why I will not be supporting the bill at stage one. Rona Mackay, followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm very happy to be speaking in this debate and would like to state at the outset that I'm fully supportive of this bill and I thank John Finney for bringing it forward. The Scottish Government have always strived to promote and protect children's rights and I believe this bill is an integral part of that. It would bring Scots law into line with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child which make it clear that there should be an end to corporal punishment in all settings including the home. Presently the United Kingdom is one of only four countries in the EU not to legislate against the physical punishment of children in all settings. Scotland must lead the way here. Children do not have the same protection against assault that adults do, and that's simply shocking. Presiding officer, hitting children can never be justified. There is no such thing as justifiable assault. If there isn't for adults, why should it be so for children? It's an admission that as an adult... Yes. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
I'm, I'm very grateful to Rona Mackay for giving way. Uh, does she agree with me that uh, the Conservatives have said several times in this debate that this law is unworkable, but the defence of reasonable punishment or reasonable chastisement used to um, be applied to men's assault of their wives and of their servants, but happily were repealed some time ago? Rona Mackay. Thank you. I absolutely, totally agree. It's totally archaic and should be removed entirely. It's an admission that as an adult, you've, you've lost control if you have to hit your child and lashing out can only send the message to your child that hitting will bring the desired result. We know that children are affected by learned behaviour and this will result in problems for them at the start of their lives, for example, at nursery or school where they will lash out to get the result they want and can carry on throughout their life. The bill isn't, is not about changing the law. As the Stage 1 report stated, as well as providing a legislative solution, there needs to be a comprehensive public education and awareness, awareness campaign. Presiding officer, many years ago, I witnessed a distressing scene outside my local supermarket. A mother and her young son, probably aged around 12, were physically fighting with each other, kicking and slapping in equal measure. Shoppers looked down, embarrassed, and no one intervened, including, I'm ashamed to say, myself. That incident has stayed in my mind for years after I witnessed it. If the correct legislation had been in place, I'm certain people would have stepped in to say, hey, this is not acceptable and it's illegal. But no one wanted to intervene, believing it was a private matter. Presiding officer, I never want to see anything like that again. And it's just one example of why I'm entirely supportive of this bill. In my view, there's no reasonable argument for, against equal protection for children. An excellent briefing from Children First, Bernardos and NSPC Scotland points out, as we've heard, that former Irish Senator Gillian Van Turnout, who was instrumental in legislation change in the public of Ireland, states that social workers have said they now have the ability to send a clear message to parents where they can say, you're not allowed to hurt your children, so let's talk about what you can do. Let's talk about positive parenting. In Ireland, there's an overwhelm overwhelmingly positive message from civil society organisations and state agencies regarding the clarity the change in law has brought. And I believe that civil society in Scotland will experience that too. This bill and raising public awareness of it will help create a culture as change as seen in other countries and in Scotland around public health issues like smoking and seat belts. It will clearly show that Scotland doesn't tolerate violence against anybody, particularly the smallest, most vulnerable people in our society, children. I believe legislators have a duty to act when it becomes clear that the law is out of step and out of date with what evidence is saying. The evidence shows that physical punishment doesn't work and can be harmful. Children and their families deserve a law that reflects this. This bill is about changing attitudes to physical punishment of children in Scotland. It's not about making prosecutions easier or criminalising people. It's to prevent others from carrying out these actions in the first place because we know they're harmful. Presiding officer, my grandchildren can't believe that when I was at school, children were assaulted by the belt as a punishment. I want them to know that as they grew up, it was this government in Scotland that gave them equal protection against all forms of violence. It's our duty to do this for future generations. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I'm delighted to support the general principles of the Equal Protection Scotland Bill. Rhoda Grant, followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm sure there's few parents who could put their hand on their heart and say they had never smacked a child. People of my generation were not only used to being smacked as children, but we also ran the gauntlet of the belt at school, something I'm pleased to say is long gone. What is clear is using different forms of non-physical chastisement works better and it also takes the tension out of the situation. Time out, for example, removes emotion but lets the child know that they've done wrong and have forfeited their freedom as a result. As I said, in my youth, physical punishment was widespread both at school and at home. And most of it was carried out proportionately, but some not. And it was difficult to see where that line was drawn. When physical punishment was banned at school, we heard the same arguments that we're now hearing today. Children went home with bruised and bloodied wrists. How on earth was that right? And I don't think anybody would go back to those days. I remember a number of years ago walking down the street ahead of some adults and children. One little boy was whinging away. Yes, he was annoying, but he was hardly bad. 
He was warned to shut up on a number of occasions. Then I heard him being physically punished. I was ahead and could only hear this. I could hear the smacks raining down on him. I could hear his screams of pain, and the more he cried, the more he was smacked. Alongside that came the verbal assault about how terrible a child he was. There was no love whatsoever in that punishment, and the horror of it remains with me to this day. I'm clear that it was not reasonable chastisement, but how could I prove that? Should I have intervened? To my shame, I did not. I went home feeling sick to my stomach. I did not see it. I'd heard it. I wonder what became of that child. He'll be an adult now. His start in life leaves me with little hope for his future. We have all witnessed when a child has done something naughty and ran into the road without looking. We've seen the parent grab an arm, pull them back, and we've heard that parent shout at them, telling them how dangerous that was. No one questions the reaction to a fright. Frankly, you would do the same if an adult was to run into the road as well, and no one would consider that assault. Prosecutions need to be in the public interest, and there has to be intent. We hear from other countries that removing the protection of reasonable chastisement has not led to an increase in prosecution. But what it does do is remove a defence against abuse. We all know the difference between assault and intervention to promote safety. To say that parents will be criminalised, I believe, is nonsense. That said, there will be a few spurious reports, I'm sure, especially maybe parents at war. But we know that we have checks and balances within our justice system. There is a process to go through, a police investigation, corroboration, and then the oversight of prosecutors. Those provide safeguards to spurious prosecutions. And I'll take the intervention. Liam Kerr. Just on that point, uh, the member talks about spurious uh, reports. What is the member's view of that? Because presumably that's collateral damage on this analysis, that perfectly good parents may be subject to the criminal justice system. Rhoda Grant. That, that is not a reason to continue allowing the assault of a child. There are always spurious allegations. We need to deal with that and make sure that anyone making that is charged with wasting police time apart from anything else. That doesn't mean we don't uh, legislate to protect children. There's also concerns when people are, voice, are voicing that it interferes with family life. But the law as it stands currently interferes with family life because it's allowing a different bar with regard to chastisement by a parent compared to that of another adult. To follow this argument through to its conclusion, you could argue that taking action against domestic abuse is also interfering in family life. Family, for most of us, it's the safest place you can be, surrounded by loved ones who have your best interests at heart. But it is not the case for all. We all know child abuse happens. How many others like me did not interfere because the law, because the law allows reasonable chastisement? How does my reasonableness compare with yours? The law needs to protect young and old alike. Um, I think I'm out of time. Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for giving way and I think she raises an important point because people have different ideas about what's reasonable, people have uh, different ideas about uh, you know, what, what, what's severe enough uh, to, to merit intervention from the police. Does she agree with me that it would be better if the bill set out in detail uh, tests that, that, that made, made it very clear and obvious what was right and what was wrong? Rhoda Grant. I think we all know um, what is the difference between assault and what is the difference between pulling somebody back. Um, we don't walk down the street and wonder if someone's been assaulted. If we see someone being assaulted, we know it. Um, and it is the same with children. But what it does is make very clear that you don't... Uh, can I make some progress? Can I answer no, your no. last intervention? What, what, what is very clear is we shouldn't have a different bar for children as we do for adults, because I think we recognise what assault is. And if you start trying to categorise that in the law, then you create loopholes. And I think that would be, um, that would be um, very unhelpful at this stage. Presiding officer, I understand there are different views about this. Um, and who hasn't had a moment of fright with a child and grabbed them and smacked them or whatever? But that doesn't mean it's right. 
It takes time and consistency to make time out and other alternatives work. And we know that parents face competing demands. However, we're the adults, the parents are the adults, and we need to educate the whole of society in good parenting skills. And we need to learn patience with children. Um, and if I could just finish off on a, a small point, how many of us have seen a child having a meltdown, a baby crying, and watched people tutting at, at the parent for not controlling that child? I've also seen on occasions where an ad, another adult steps in and helps. I think we all need to be more tolerant and learn to step in and help rather than criticise. Gail Ross, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer, and um, can I agree with the comments made by Rhoda Grant there in her very last um, paragraph of her speech. Um, can I thank the member in charge of this bill, John Finney, for bringing it forward and his staff as well for all their hard work. It has been stated already, but it's worth stating again, that Article 19 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child states that, I quote, state parties must take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect children from all forms of physical or mental violence from any person who has care of the child, unquote. We are incorporating the UNCRC into Scots law in the term of this parliament. We aren't just getting it right for every child. We have one of the most sophisticated welfare-based systems of dealing with children who offend. We have a baby box. We are becoming trauma-informed. Yet we still had to have a defence in the law that says if you are a parent or a carer and you're charged with hitting a child, you can fall back on a defence of reasonable chastisement. Now, presiding officer, this bill, as we've heard, does not create a new offence it removes that defence. And it also aims to foster a change in societal attitudes with alternative methods of positive parenting that do not include punishing children physically. As John Finney and Rona Mackay have already mentioned, parallels have been drawn with other culture changes that began with legislation that maybe weren't that popular at the start, including the wearing of seatbelts or smoking indoors in public places. Now, in oral evidence sessions to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, the vast majority of witnesses agreed that the evidence in favour of removing this is overwhelming and that this bill has to become law if we are to see a change. Now, at this point, I would like to thank all the witnesses that gave evidence, but I would also especially like to thank our clerks for the absolutely fantastic job that they did in sometimes extremely challenging circumstances. Presiding officer, despite what has been written in the minority statement, the convener and the clerks made every effort to try and get different views on whether the principles of this bill could be supported or not. And we did hear from some witnesses that smacking, used in the context of a loving family setting, only administered in extreme circumstances, perhaps to communicate a message of safety, could and should still be used. But... There was an overwhelming volume of evidence to explain why even what is constituted as mild or reasonable smacking should not be used. NHS Tayside told the committee that physical punishment of children is associated with, quote, a range of adverse outcomes, including emotional and behavioural problems, anxiety and depression, physical abuse and antisocial behaviour and violence in childhood and adulthood. Additionally, the evidence is that physical punishment doesn't work. It's ineffective in achieving moral inter internalization of the values and behaviors the discipline is trying to encourage." Unquote. So why do parents smack? Is it just a momentary lapse of control or is it used systematically by parents to communicate? Well, it can be both. And I pressed this point in two of our evidence sessions in order to understand better why smacking was used. I was told by one witness that, quote, smacking is communicating with a child through light pain, unquote. And by another, that it was indeed, quote, a slightly painful thing, unquote. Should children learn through fear of pain? No, I don't think they should. Children should learn through love and understanding. President officer, yes. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful to the member for this because she knows I have a lot of sympathy with what she says, but 
isn't the uh, logical extension that it's better to, to educate parents uh, not to go down this route rather than risking criminalising them? Gail Ross. I'm happy that Liam Kerr has actually brought that up because I do address that later on in my speech and I will come to that. Um, so there were also a number of concerns about criminalising parents, additional burdens on resources and existing staff. But we did hear, hear evidence that other countries such as Ireland that have brought in similar legislation have seen little or no increase in the prosecution of parents. But we do, however, envisage that there may be an increase in reporting and that resources will have to be put in place to deal with this. And this will include more positive parenting advice and help for families for whom English is not a first language and who also may come from countries where corporal punishment is more widely used. And should this be bill become law, as has men been mentioned before as well, there will have to be an awareness raising campaign and guidance for professionals and organisations. Angela Constance, in her brilliant speech, talked about parenting not being easy, and I think all the parents in the chamber will agree with that. You don't need to be a parent to know that this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But what we do need to be very careful about is making sure that the message is not to make children that have been smacked think that they're damaged in any way. And we must also ensure that parents who currently use or have used smacking in the past are not guilty and made to feel like they've done something wrong. This is not an exercise in guilt, it is about education and understanding. So in conclusion, presiding officer, this bill sees the rights of children put on a par with adults and it encourages a culture change. But it has been argued that in this case, a change in culture cannot happen without legislation and that's to deal with Liam Kerr's point. If we were only to do a public awareness raising campaign, that there is no justification to hit a child, but then still have a justification for it in our legal system, it sends out completely the wrong message to parents. So I'll leave you with the words of Gillian Van Turnhout, the former Irish senator and committee witness, quote, we know that when a child is hit, they immediately forget everything that happened beforehand because the person whom they love and cherish has hit them. There is no connection to what the child did, unquote. The law is clear that you do not raise your hand to another adult. The law also needs to be clear that you do not, do not raise your hand to a child either. And this bill brings that clarity. Thank you. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Christine Graham. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, it gives me no pleasure to speak in today's debate, but someone needs to speak up for Scotland's children, parents and families. Our current criminal law rightly prohibits parents from assaulting their children, and that is the way it should be. And I think that is a unanimously agreed proposition, at least I would hope so. We already have the right laws and procedures in place to guarantee this. The misleadingly named Children Equal Protection from Assault Bill is not about protecting, supporting, and nurturing our children and families. It is a misguided attempt to tell parents how to raise their own children under threat of being treated as criminals and facing the full force of the state if they do not. Now, however, I'll not take an intervention at this stage as I want to address the imbalance, I think, that has been in the debate before this place. However well-meaning some supporters of the bill may be, they overlook that crucial point. Families are the bedrock of any stable and civilized society in which the best interests of children can be protected. The state cannot pretend to replace the family, and one which does will fail. A point, not at this moment, a point clearly made by the UK Supreme Court in the named persons case. Now, Jonathan Sumption QC, recently retired justice of the UK Supreme Court, makes a key point in his recent Wreath Lectures on BBC Radio 4 about the problem with a lot of current lawmaking. He says, and I quote, we are afraid to let people be guided by their own moral judgments in case they arrive at judgments which we do not agree with, end quote. That is what we are dealing with here, and such bad law upsets good families. Consideration, I have to say, of the bill before us has been a far cry 
from the informed, careful and considered approach taken with the current law, which was clarified in 2003. Supporters of the bill have had the free run of proceedings before this parliament and in committee. In spite of an overwhelming response to the committee for members of the public against the bill, it chose to hear overwhelmingly in its public proceedings from supporters instead. Nor did it hear in those public sessions from many who submitted against the bill. Crucially, individuals in the front line dealing with the courts and child protection. Experts, not at this stage. Experts in the practice, in their field, and the workings of our current law. Surely, the Lord Advocate, head of Scotland's prosecution service, should have appeared before the committee to answer questions on the bill. But no, we are told he is invited to give evidence later. It is entirely unsatisfactory in these circumstances for Parliament to be asked to approve the bill. And what of the unsatisfactory, unresolved issue of the alteration of the committee minutes rightly raised by my colleague Oliver Mundell in his point of order on 15th May? And the provision of parliamentary and other publicly funded resources to support and promote the bill on all sides, but a lack of availability to those who wish to scrutinize. Lack of openness, lack of transparency, an unwillingness to listen, and a failure to respond to concerns raised. These are issues that simply will not go away. My fear is that the committee and the parliament will receive a simple fail from the public on this one if, if the situation is not addressed now. Because the message sent out 20 years after this parliament began is that it is neither the people's parliament nor a listening parliament. We are being asked to approve a bill and proposition that has not changed one iota since conception to coming to this point. In spite of the information by Spice pointing to the crucial differences in other legal systems, this bill does not propose what they have as law in New Zealand nor in other countries which are relied upon. These are differences which should have been the subject of full consideration and research not carried out in spite of my request for it. In fact, the unanimous public evidence from supporters of the bill in any event to the committee that parents should not be criminalized by fining them or imprisoning them has in effect equally been ignored. For this is what the bill provides for. If it needed amendment at the outset, it now obviously does. Elected politicians really should not assume they have some sort of divine right to tell others what to do. And so I conclude quoting the words of a mother and constituent who wrote to me last week, and this is what she wrote to me amongst other things. The state has ever made an awful parent. I am tired of special interest groups, selective consultations, liberal virtue signaling, and media bias trumping plain decency and common sense. I confess my faith in politicians to act in line with democracy is at an all-time low. Could you restore it, please? Speak, act, and vote against John Finney's children equal protection from Assault Scotland Bill, and that is what I shall do. Christine Graham, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by congratulating the member on his commitment to his member's bill? As one who's had a few in this parliament, I'm only too aware of the time and effort which goes into this process. As a preliminary, let me also say that, like everyone in here, I, I understand, but do not support someone smacking his or her children for wrongdoing. I also find it patronising to be told or to be alluded to, not by someone in here, that someone of a certain vintage does not want to ban smacking because, quote, I was smacked and it did me no harm. I'm not in that category. Times change, and rightly so. Ross Greer reminded us the TOS was banned decades ago, quite rightly. My sons do not and never have smacked or used physical punishment on their children, neither do I or my grandchildren. What granny does? And I would be hard put to recall any time in recent years when I've seen a parent physically punishing a child in public, shouting and even screaming at them in the supermarket, yes, 
And as a parent, I can understand why that can happen, and that can be just as harmful, but not hitting them. So first question, do we need this legislation? Policies which have changed our views on disciplining and parenting, the provision of free nursery places, education and social mores, have meant that in public places, smacking is, to all intents and purposes, gone for good or, at worst, out of sight. And indeed, rights can be enshrined in common law, in case law, not only in statute. Second question, if this proceeds as it stands, what then will be the impact on private places, the family home? Will the parent who relied on so-called justifiable assault, a most unfortunate term, think twice? Will parents postpone punishment with the words, wait till I get you home? If breached and reported, by whom? What will the evidence be? Will every report require a police visit, a report? Corroboration will be required for any proposed prosecution. And I know, can I just make a little point, certainly. Um, and then I quote from uh, uh, G Neil Hunter, Scottish Children's Reporters Administration, who states, the existence of a spectrum of violence in children's lives, particularly in the household, has a very adverse impact on their well-being and outcomes. I couldn't agree more. Mr Finney. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm, I'm very grateful for the member taking an intervention. For, as a matter of point, the, the children's uh, reporter system support the bill. I wonder if the member would acknowledge that much of what she said in relation to the, the assault on children in the House could apply to domestic violence, which is now rightly addressed in a different approach by not only public, but also the statutory agencies. Christine Graham. I'll, I'll address the part about the, the, the children's reporter. The point is, he didn't say that, it, what he did say was, it really is particular in the household. And my concern is that while this proposed legislation may be something in public places, I really cannot see how it could successfully operate where in the private, in the home, where it would be difficult to police, difficult to prosecute. And indeed, the stage one report remarks on the small number of prosecutions following the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003, which prohibited shaking or use of an implement. First, the small number of prosecutions referred to in the report does not necessarily establish the 2003 Act changed behaviour. It may have. We don't know or are not told in the stage one report. How many police investigations were there? How many reports? And how many of these went to the Crown? And how many of the Crown did not proceed with through lack of evidence or because it was not in the public interest? It is a case of having evidence, detailed evidence, did parents stop shaking in public at least because of public pressure and similarly with hitting or because of the 2003 Act? How many public even know of the 2003 Act and what it does? What we do know is that children are still hit, shaken, beaten, smacked in private when cases end up either with social work or indeed when tragedies make front page headlines. Will this bill change that? I don't know. It seems from the social work evidence, at least as I read it, that it will not impact on their caseload. Then there's a the necessity for clarity in the law. The definition that is given in the bill that physical punishment of a child in the exercise of a parental right or a right derived from having charge of care of a child is justifiable and is therefore not an assault ceases to have effect. It is therefore an assault. Whether it is prosecuted or not is another matter, but it's still an assault. The definition of assault in Scots law is, if, as I understand it, is a physical attack on another or threat of such, which is intended to cause bodily injury or which puts the victim in a state of fear that he or she may be about to suffer bodily injury. These two, to me, do not sit side by side. Unpicking this. A child slapped across the arm for some wrongdoing which fits in with the member's definition of an assault, but would you call it an attack? As by definition it is an assault, that will require some inquiry, although at the end of the day the Crown may decide it's not in the public interest to prosecute. I understand that. And again, I agree that it's a shame that the evidence of the Lord Advocate was not heard before we get to the stage one report. It's crucial as head of prosecutions and looking at what is in the public interest in Scotland. So what is the pain? Again, I will stick to a public place to believe it is appropriate to do. A slap in the hand for reaching for the forbidden sweets at the checkout. It certainly is an assault as defined by the bill. 
So while I really understand the entirely worthy motives of the member, there are too many unanswered questions for me to support this bill as it stands, like an elephant, which is better defined visually, likewise an assault. We know an elephant when we see one, and we should certainly know an assault when we see one. Statute legislation can be heavy-handed, forgive the metaphor. It's a heavy-handed way of delivering social change. And as this bill currently stands, it is, in my view, not fit for purpose, with a whole host of possible unintended consequences. As Angela Constance said quite rightly, it is good that it leads to a better discussion on parenting, but statute needs to be robust and tested before enacted. We need more evidence. I need it at least before. I'll support this accordingly. It's my intention to abstain at decision time. Good intentions must be matched by good legislation. Claire Baker, followed by James Dornan. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to first thank the committee for the work they have done over recent months to produce this Stage 1 report. They have attempted to be thorough and engage with the debate which surrounds this member's bill from John Finney, and I also thank the member and his team for their work. I recognise there was a minority position on the bill from the Conservative members, which questioned some of this work. But as all of us on committees recognise, and as an MSP who has recently scrutinised the Census Amendment Bill, I have recent experience, it can be challenging to satisfy all views on what are sometimes contentious issues. However, while some will put the case that has been articulated during the Stage 1 evidence that the Bill negates the rights of parents and family life, that it um, demonstrates the interference of the state and it denies the right to religious freedoms, these are not arguments that I find convincing reasons to stop the progress of the Bill. I am convinced by the argument that children should receive the same protection under the law as adults. I agree with that general principle and I support the bill proceeding on that basis. While John Finney introduced the bill in 2017, this is not the first time this issue has been discussed in Parliament. My former colleague Scott Barry, who was the first MSP for Dunfermline, argued the case in the early days of the Parliament and received quite a challenging time from the media. The then Scottish Executive introduced a consultation on the issue before going on to introduce some legislative changes which others have outlined today. You can look back on that previous debate and reflect on why there wasn't broad enough support at the time. The law was changed to give parents a justification through reasonable chastisement under circumstan circumstances. We didn't then have a commitment to introduce the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. The voices of children and young people weren't heard or listened to then as they are now. And the Parliament in its early days was not free of controversy and questions over its relevance. All these factors contributed perhaps to the limited changes that were then made. So this is unfinished business of the Scottish Parliament. And as a serious modern legislature that is committed to meeting its international human rights obligations and not being in breach of the UNCRC, we need to remove the defence of reasonable chastisement. We have been on a path which has dramatically changed our society's attitude towards children and young people. We no longer have corporal punishment in schools. We recognise the rights of children to protection. Physical assault as a means of teaching or controlling children is increasingly unacceptable and now recognised as counterproductive. As a society, we still have issues with violence. And while we can point to factors such as alcohol as an aggravator for that, we should recognise that a society which permits the physical chastisement of children is acceptable needs to reflect on what terms that sets for adult and future parental relationships. Research into the effectiveness of physical punishment as a parenting tool finds that it's not effective in achieving parental goals. There's little evidence to suggest that it improves children's behaviour in the long term and that it can exacerbate the problem behaviour. While the committee heard evidence from groups representing adults, it did take considerable evidence from children and young people, including Kirkcaldy YMCA juniors. Um, I did reflect on it. I saw an episode of Super Nanny a few years ago, and it was a family with loving parents who used smacking as a means of exerting parental authority. The dad who did the smacking, he wasn't enraged when he did it. It was a controlled reaction to bad behaviour, and they thought it didn't cause any harm. They did a secret interview with the children, and the children expressed their love for their parents and how happy they were, but said it upset them when they got smacked, and it, it spoiled the relationship with their father. And when the parents saw it, I can remember that reaction of the parents, they were absolutely horrified that their behaviour was having this impact on their children. They didn't conceive that what they thought was light parental control with a bit of smacking was causing their children that level of concern, and it changed those parents' behaviour. So being a parent can at times be difficult, and children of all ages can be frustrating, and parents wish to protect them from harm. 
but the examples of children running into roads or reaching out to fires, resulting in a tap on the wrist that then leads to prosecution, are, I feel, trivial examples. There is no evidence to support that that is what's happening in countries which already have enacted similar legislation. As Dr Louise Hill informed the committee, International research indicates there is no increase in prosecutions as a result of a change in legislation. There is, however, a decrease in the use of physical punishment and a decrease in physical assault. And she also said, we think that there could be a reduction in prosecutions as a result of the bill because of the culture change that will happen. At present, the UK is one of only four countries in the EU not to legislate against the physical punishment of children in all settings. There is no evidence to support concerns that loving parents will be criminalised or that protection services will be overwhelmed. I respect those that have raised concern over these issues and it will be the job of future stages of the bill or accompanying guidance to further address these concerns. But I do believe the bill is workable and can be implemented in a way which is understood by parents, by the police and courts, that is enforced in a way which is sensible and proportionate. No one argued during stage one in favour of hurting children and no one supported violence against children. But views differed on whether smacking was a violent act. While the bill's consultation received significant support, there is a challenge to address in public polling. Although there is a degree of support for smacking, there is also strong support for protecting children. And some of us see that as a contradiction. But smacking is not just about the degree of violence. It is about preferring a physical reaction over communication. It is about exerting power in a way which can be humiliating and hurtful. Adults who defend smacking because it did them no harm do still remember that they were smacked and they rarely talk about the good that it did them. The bill extends the same legal protection for our children that exist for adults and I am pleased to support the general principles. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I also would like to pay tribute to John Finney for his tireless work and commitment to bringing this bill about today. This bill may not have unanimous backing, certainly not in the Parliament nor by the public, but it's a vital step forward in creating a fairer and more equal society for all in Scotland. And children and young people should rightly be at the very heart of this. I've had a few constituents visit my surgery to discuss this issue on both sides of it. And although I dis sit in the, don't sit in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, as a father and a grandfather, I've been very interested in the progress and formation of the bill over the last months. For myself, it's been worthwhile trying to understand what young people themselves think about being smacked as a form of discipline, or as some parents have expressed, as a form of guidance. The Scottish Youth Parliament is an institution which we should be immensely proud of. And before I make my point, I want to take this opportunity to publicly th thank the two MYSPs in my constituency, Ellie Craig and Zaneeb Ahmad, um, for the hard work and commitment to our community, and of course all the other MSYPs whose contributions often help mould debates and legislation such as today's. As mentioned by John Finney, the Scottish Youth Parliament included the issue of physical punishment in a consultation in 2016, and they received over 72,000 responses from Scottish young people, 82% of which agreeing that physical assault in children should be illegal. It's pretty clear from research and anecdotal evidence that children find smacking hurtful, it upsets them, and an adult lifting their hands to a young child would be a terribly traumatic experience, but also has no long-term positive effect. I grew up in a home where both my parents were pretty strict and I was always well aware where the line was. But my father was able to command my respect with lifting his hand to me only twice. And I can assure you I completely understand why he felt the need to do that at the time. The only time I physically punished one of my kids was when we were crossing the road. He slipped out my hand and stepped back into the road. I managed to grab him, pull him back to me and then scalped his bahookie whilst hugging him at the same time talk about mixed messages. And the reality is, of course, that I never scalped him to teach him a lesson, but as an instinct based on my fear of what could have happened, he would have got much more from my show of affection and concern than the scalp ever gave him. As it was the same in the, the millions of occasions where my dad explained, comforted and cared for me were the, uh, than the two occasions mentioned earlier, because they did absolutely nothing for or to me. And all those two occasions, all those occasions did was, they embarrassed my dad and, and I was embarrassed and ashamed by my behaviour after uh, the wee was running across the road. I've seen a few people protesting this bill, saying things like, my parents hit me when I was younger and it never caused me any harm. However, we could say this about many things in my generation's youth. For example, I rode my bike without my helmet. The fact I never had an accident was just luck. 
We sat with our children on our knees in the cars and just prayed there wouldn't be an accident. And I could keep on listing safety issues of my youth, which never harmed me, but the fact is they could have, and sadly did harm many others. Legislation like today's bills are important steps to try and help alter our behaviour. And that's why, as a government and as a parliament, we must take progressive steps to protect our children and to encourage parents as they continue to grow. Earlier in this speech, I mentioned that I'd had some constituents come to my surgeries concerned that their rights as a parent and grandparent were being removed. Presiding officer, I've no doubt these constituents have the best interests of their children and their family at heart. But sometimes we have to acknowledge that our current ways just aren't working. For example, if you were standing next to an adult who had his headphones in and the lack of concentration led him to step in front of moving traffic, you'd pull the adult back, but you definitely wouldn't hit him. Why? Because we know that would be an assault. So what's the difference between that and me hitting my son? Whenever we choose to discipline children by corporal methods, as the law stands at the moment, we can only do so if we have absolute certainty that in that moment we had no malice, no anger, no rage, no frustration and no resentment towards that child. Who amongst us could be sure of that? I certainly know that when I hit my son, it was through anger and frustration that I couldn't protect him from, do from doing what he did. Mm -hmm. Corporal punishment is the most widespread form of violence against children. If the ch child is old enough to be smacked, then they should also be old enough for alternative consequences to be levied to them. Surely for the youngest of our society, discipline is always about educating them by using better methods. When we raise a hand or an object to a child of whatever age, we signal to them nothing other than the intent to cause pain and suffering. No adult will ever look back in their childhood with fond memories of their physical punishments, nor will any of them recall a start change in their motivation to alter their behaviour. The overriding memory will be fear, pain and upset, all of which are catastrophic to the healthy emotional development of a child. Children are charged to us to care for in the same way we care for all vulnerable people in our society. We must then take care over the fragility of that which is in our care and understanding that each and every action we take impacts upon their lives for the entirety of their time they're on this earth, not just in that moment. Instead of more discipline, we need more tolerance, patience and love. Yeah. Countries all over the world are already taking steps to protect the rights of children with equal protection. 54 countries have already prohibited the physical punishment of children, with a further 56 committed to reforming the laws to achieve a ban in all settings. And as has previously been stated, the United Kingdom is one of only four states in the EU not to legislate against the physical punishment of children. So I'm proud that this parliament has taken the first steps in moving us towards a brighter future for all our children and fully support the principles of John Finney's bill. Thank you. I call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Richard Lyle. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. The State One report states the purpose of the bill is to abolish the defence of reasonable chastisement and drive cultural change to discourage the use of physical punishment. The defence of reasonable chastisement can currently be used by parents and others caring, caring for or in charge of children if they are prosecuted for assaulting a child. The defence allows for physical force to be used to discipline a child with some restrictions set out in the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003, Section 51. Whilst I do not doubt for a second the well-intentioned motivation of John Finney in seeking to introduce this bill <coughs> and those who support it, the fact is that rather than driving cultural change and discouraging physical punishment, what the bill does is to criminalise reasonable chastisement and the parents who do not roll out having this as a measured and proportionate tool in the box to use in certain circumstances, should they consider this appropriate, effective and necessary. I will give way to this intervention, but I do want to develop my argument. Alice Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for uh, the member giving way. She references um, the use of a tool proportionately. Um, she also referenced the 2003 Criminal Justice Act, which talked about, uh, which sets the limits of physical punishment to headshots, uh, to uh, banning headshots, the use of implements and shaking, and that's it. Does she not recognise that this creates confusion in a grey area, which actually will lead to parents quite significantly harming their children in deploying that resource? I think the confusion in this debate, and the member is guilty of it too, 
as repeatedly talking about assault and the assault of children without taking any cognizance of what determines assault in the law. And it's a point Christine Gray made very effectively. It's the context, the circumstances, and the relationship. And by abolishing reasonable chastisement, you're turning that whole um, law of evidence on its, on its head. Supporters of the bill insist this criminalization is not what the bill aims to do. Nonetheless, it is without doubt a consequence of abolishing the reasonable chastisement defense, which cannot be dismissed or gloss over. Put simply, it is not satisfactory or acceptable to legislate for one outcome and hope for another. Above all, the, must, the law must provide proof. Um, clarity. If you don't mind, John Finney, I realise I'm in the minority speaking and I do want to develop my argument and I think it's worth listening to. The Crown Office and Procurator Fisco stated in a written response to the Equalities Committee that it is quite possible that the reporting of the assault described by this bill will increase due to the proposed removal of the defence of reasonable chastisement and also due to the increase of reporting from publicity and awareness raising usually accompanies this uh, legislation. At the same time, the Crown Office acknowledges that there's a lack of case law to determine when physical contact of an extremely minor or physical nature could be considered to meet the public interest test to prosecute. However, we do know that under the bill's provision, cases are to be assessed individually and to establish if there is criminal con uh, intent, there will be, at the very least, um, a police investigation and a referral to the procurator fiscal or even a criminal trial. A valid question to be posed here is what happens to the children when these investigations are in progress? Do they remain with their parents or are they taken into care? If the latter, if the latter, given the delays in the court process, this could result not just in a lengthy separation, but all the other well-documented trauma-related adverse con consequences suffered by children in care. But if, as John Finney has said, the bill's intention is not to criminalise parents, but to set out a direction of travel about child welfare and child upbringing and to support children, then it seems to me there is a better way to move forward. Language is important. In the bill, light and rare physical chastisement is equated to child abuse and described as assault. This is emotive language which polarizes opinion and stifles informed debate about how to achieve the best child welfare policies. More generally, Further work requires to be done regarding the use of restraint and the use of physical intervention by a parent to keep a child safe on one hand and on the other hand, restraint in educational and care settings where certain groups of children's behaviour can be challenging and restraint is used in order to contain them, not to punish them. In order to drive the cultural change to discourage the use of physical um, intervention, there needs to be more awareness and, clarify, and clarification, I accept, on the existing law, which constitutes reasonable chastisement, and, crucially, the parenting support available to families. If a parent, and both Angela Conch and I think James Dorman mentioned this, has smacked a child due to a loss of control or stress, Surely, the focus should be on ensuring the necessary support is available to help them cope rather than issuing a police warning or prosecuting. And here at present, current routes um, that the, the Scottish Government utilises to communicate with parents are not clear. So, presiding officer, I believe the best and most effective way forward would be to instead support the Equalities Committee's request to receive this information, together with an outline of how the Scottish Government intends to reach families who are not currently involved in any relevant services and to provide details of the support which will then be made available to them, 
rather than rushing to legislate to ban the reasonable chastisement defence. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle to be followed with a brief contribution from Mike Rumbles. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly remind the Chamber that this is a Green Members' Party Bill? Um, today I'm going to be out of step with the majority, so be it. This bill raises the spectre of good parents being criminalised for using mild chastisement and the police and social workers having to waste time investigating decent families when they should be focusing all their attention on identifying child abuse. And I am against parents hitting, slapping, abusing their kids. Yes, very much so. It's wrong. Rightly, we're all committed to protecting children from any violence, and the law is very clear in that matter. The present law prohibits all violence against children in Section 51 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003, specifically outlaws shaking and the use of any implement. Supporters of this legislation claim that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child compels us to ban smacking. But I don't see that in the text of the Convention. Article 19 of the UNCRC states that children should be protected from violence, abuse and neglect. It seems to me that Scotland already fulfills its obligations in terms of the Convention. Our law is clear, progressive, and I'd remind members that this law in this area was updated as recently as 2004. Back then, another proposal to criminalise smacking was abandoned in what the then Cabinet Secretary described as a victory for common sense. We're a long way from the days of yore when parents could belt a child or use the underslip of a slipper. Any adult who does not this in Scotland today can expect to be punished severely by the courts, and I would say rightly so. The Member's legislation concerns the defence of justifiable assault or reasonable chastisement. This defence allows parents to use a tap in the hand, a smack in the behind without being prosecuted. That is all it does. I am not aware of any evidence from any court or the police that it is ineffective that it allows parents to use the unreasonable force of their children or to use unreasonable force uh, with their children. It will make a tap in the hand or the bottom a criminal offence. That's why newspapers call it a smacking ban. President officer, my children grew up in a loving environment. I am a grandfather of three beautiful grandchildren who I have the privilege of spending time with regularly. They are my wife's and my, my life. My time with them has made me realise that this legislation could or would hurt families. It's not uncommon to see a parent or a grandparent giving a child a wee tap in the backside in public, even in a playful way. I've seen it happening as I waited to, to collect my grandson from a primary school one day. A grandfather had his granddaughter in his arms. He was giving her a playful tap. The little girl was laughing, but from a distance, that could have looked like a smack and could be reported to the police. What then? Someone could report that grandfather for what they mis mistakenly had seen. Supporters of this bill claim the police will never prosecute these actions, but how can they be so sure? Under this legislation, smacking will be reported to the police. Police will have to record it as a crime, investigate it. They might arrest a mum or a dad, question them. It might mean getting a child in their own in a room and trying to get a statement against the mum or the dad. Presiding officer, the police and social services are going to be inundated with trivial reports under this legislation, and they have to treat them as seriously as they currently consider abuse. I'm sure that frontline professionals who are already under great pressure will, appreciate this, will not appreciate this additional workload, especially when resources are stretched already. I wonder how, no, how, I wonder how this legislation will be misused in domestic circumstances when relationships between parents break down. We might see dishonest parents accusing their spouses of smacking in order to prevent access to children. It happens, and don't think it won't happen, because it will happen. It will happen. President officer, it is clear to me and the majority of people that I represent in Uddingston and Belsill constituency that this law is unnecessary. The polls I've seen on this issue also confirm that 74% of people don't want a smacking ban. And I've had numerous emails from concerned constituents confirming this. So today, with the greatest regret, in my 43 years in politics, I've sometimes had to stick up 
and stick, stick to my guns, even against the tide. So today, even against the majority, I cannot lend my name to this bill and have to, in all conscience, abstain. And I hope my reasons for doing so are not misunderstood or misinterpreted by anyone. Thank you. A brief intervention from Mike Rumbles. Yeah. Um, I wasn't down to speak in this debate, but I want to respond to Annie Wells, Gordon Mitchell and Margaret Mitchell, uh, Gordon Lindhurst and Margaret Mitchell in particular. This issue was raised when I was here in the first session of the Parliament 16 years <coughs> ago. And I, like them, was worried about criminalising good parents and I didn't support the measure, to my shame. I am now a convert to this cause and I hope my comments may reassure members like Annie Wells, Gordon Lindhurst and Margaret Mitchell that their fears about criminalising parents are misplaced. Why have I changed my mind? Because of my experiences on the Health Committee in the second session when we passed the ban on smoking in enclosed public places. We heard the same arguments that we would see a huge rise in prosecutions of previously law-abiding people. I've only got one more minute and it simply, it simply didn't happen. It's because of that, I don't believe for one moment that we will see previously law-abiding and loving parents, I've only got one minute, dragged into our courts. It will not happen. This is not about attacking the rights of good and loving parents. It's not about the state telling parents how to bring up their children. It isn't. It is about removing the defense in law. It is about removing the defense in law of reasonable chastisement from people already likely to be in front of our courts. And I would say to members such as Annie Wells, Gordon Lindhurst, and yes, Richard Lyle, that their worries are unfounded. I would also say that this member's bill is about our parliament doing its job, and I would remind Gordon Lindhurst gently that this is only the stage one debate. The bill couldn't be amended before stages <laughs> two and three. So I'm somewhat puzzled by, Gordon's, by Gordon Lindhurst's earlier comments. I, I can't, unfortunately. I've only got 10 seconds. <laughs> I speak as a convert on this issue. I would urge those who are worried about the bill to engage with it at stages two and three, and I hope but after our further scrutiny of this bill, they will, like me, see the sense of this measure. And I only wish I had done this 16 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rumbles. I, I call uh, Fulton McGregor before we move to closing speeches. Fulton McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer. And for me, it's a great pleasure to speak in this debate today. Um, firstly, as a member of the a committee that scrutinised the legislation at stage one and uh, secondly as a, a former social worker and I'd also like to put on record my thanks to um, John Finney. Uh, for me this, th this bill is, uh, is really simple uh, to support and it's got a simple uh, premise to give children equal protection the same as adults. It removes a defence as we've heard from others that is outdated and belongs firmly in history and this parliament has a strong track record in progressive legislation such as in domestic abuse and children's rights, among other things. And it's about time that we join the other 54 countries and remove this defence. And as we heard um, through other speakers and as we heard on committee, the vast majority of agencies who spoke to us at committee and have contacted us before this debate are for it. And there's a real strong support. Bernardo's, Children's First, Amnesty International and many, many others. And that in itself should tell us something. And that's because, and to disagree with people on the, the, the Tory benches and some folk and moan benches, it's a no-brainer. Uh, in my opinion, if this was 20 years down the line, it would have been brought forward as secondary legislation. And that's not to diminish anything that, that Mr Finney is bringing forward. We know that physical punishment is harmful and can lead to aggressive behaviour. And those points have been made and made well by others. The Tories, in my mind, have tried to make politics out of this. And you've heard that from Oliver Mundell and Annie Wells. And I mentioned those two because they were on the committee and they didn't fully engage in the committee process. They will say that they, well, they didn't, they didn't. They will say that they're against the violence. They will say, no, I won't. They will say they're against violence against children, but they are not. They want to keep us in the deep past and do not even have the dignity to try and alleviate genuine concerns that the public are bringing forward. No, I won't because I've not uh, received one intervention today myself. But there are some in the chamber, including, I believe, on the Tory benches and in the public, who didn't hear all the evidence. So I want to spend the rest of my speech trying to alleviate 
the fears that they've expressed, the fears expressed by Christine Game, Richard Lyle and others. It's not about criminalisation. It's not about the criminalisation of individuals. In my social work experience, I was a, a children and family social worker for about 12 years, from 2004. And I, I, I was thinking when this bill went through, what would happen um, if, if, a, if a referral was made, if it was an, alleg an allegation made of an assault um, or, or being smacked? What would happen just now is social work and other agencies would investigate and take a measured welfare and support-based approach. If there's criminality be to be considered, then this would be done through a joint investigate investigative interview with the police, and then a decision be made on whether to refer to the PF. The PF then decides the public interest test, and that hi these hypothetical situations that parents will be criminalised for stopping their child run on the road, for example, are absolutely ridiculous. They wouldn't happen now, and they wouldn't happen if this law is passed. Think of the process and the journey that would be required for that to happen. A child would need to go to school, perhaps, or a health-based place and say that, you know, their parents stopped them running on a road. That would be investigated at that point of contact. And I see Mr Mundell laughing away there, but he's laughing away because he knows it's true, because he was on the committee. That's why he's laughing away. No, I, I, I apologies, I won't, be, I won't be taking an intervention. And, and uh, Margaret Mitchell, I, I, you know, that your, your example was, was scaremongering. It, it, it really was that we're going to have uh, parents suddenly criminalised, you know. What did Social Work Scotland and Police Scotland no? What did Social Work Scotland and Police Scotland tell us in committee? They told us that nothing would change, not a thing, and referrals would be dealt with exactly the same way as they are now. In my own experience, I can't, can't mind one thing about the defence being used. I thought about going out to situations with families, with my colleagues, and what support might be around, and uh, you know, how, how, how perhaps safeguard the family. But never once I was thinking about, oh, this family might use a defence. You know, any occasions where criminal proceedings were pursued were very clear. Indeed, I was actually probably one, I started in social work not long after the 2003 Act that's been mentioned. It's probably something that wasn't exactly clear in what the legislation was. Um, what, 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 the leg what, what the legislation was, I think many practitioners are like that. And that's actually one of the, the, the main principles of the bill as brought forward by John, uh, John Finney. It brings forward clarity for practitioners and parents. And most importantly, it sends a message of the country we want to be. It makes the current law and processes clearer. And anyone who knows John Finney and the members of the committee in favour would know, to trust us, we've been through the, we've been through the committee uh, process and we would never, never be in favour of unnecessary criminalisation of parents. It's the last thing on our minds. And the evidence from other countries is very clear that this would not be the case, in fact, far from it. But make no doubt, no doubt about it, the Tory policy here is to degrade the rights of our children. So there's people out there who maybe think it's a, a bit of state intervention or those Tory colleagues of a more liberal standing who are thinking about voting against, and to my colleagues who are thinking about voting against, please do not leave children with less rights in their own home than any other adult or animal. Be assured that child support protection processes in our country are robust and will not allow the fear, the fears that the right-wing funda fundamentalists of those benches want you to believe. They claim it as an assault on family life. The truth is to not vote for an assault on our child's rights, and that's not on. So please vote for the principles at stage one. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches. I call on Ian Gray to be followed by Liz Smith. Ian Gray. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Um, I think it's been um, uh, quite, quite an interesting debate in that we do sometimes have debates of great consensus and there hasn't been consensus really. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, there's been some quite interesting points made and I'll try to address some of them in closing. But in all of that, I think it is worth, uh, as we close this afternoon's debate, going back to the basics of um, what the reasons are for pursuing this legislation. And I think there are two significant reasons of principle. The first is the principle of equal protection, and that's the title of the bill. As many colleagues have pointed out, the bill is not designed to create a new crime. Uh, it rather removes uh, a defence, uh, which is only available when it comes to the chastisement uh, of children. And, and 
It is, I think, very difficult to get past a very simple statement that if it, if it is wrong to hit an adult, it must be wrong to hit a child uh, too. And, and Mary Fee uh, gave an example of a vulnerable adult being cared for and in the course of that care assaulted. Uh, and when you think of that case, it seems clear that that is wrong uh, and very difficult to see why it would be right if it was a child, uh, a vulnerable child rather than a vulnerable adult. But there is also, of course, um, the, the principle of uh, rights, and a number of speakers have spoken uh, about the rights basis uh, of this. And indeed, we know that the Scottish Government have committed to the incorporation of the UNCRC uh, into our legislation. And in 2016, that was also something which was promised in the Scottish Labour Manifesto. Uh, and so it is something uh, that we support. And I think that Ross Greer, uh, and Gail, Gail Ross uh, have both clearly articulated that um, the, the current legislative position we have uh, breaches Article 19. And I, I know Mr Lyle took issue uh, with that, but I think the expert opinion which the committee heard was that Article 19 is certainly breached. So there are two very strong reasons there, I think, why we do need uh, this, this legislation. Mandel. I hear what the member is saying about Article 19, but does he not recognise it's important to be able to put that question to the Lord Advocate uh, before we can say that definitively? Ian Gray. I'm absolutely sure that in the course of the legislative process that opportunity will, uh, will be taken. And uh, the point I've just made and the di different point that Mr Lyle made will be, will be fully uh, considered. Uh, and it is fair to say that there have been a number of significant concerns as well expressed uh, indeed across the the Chamber. Um, one of those, of course, is the criminalisation of parents, and we've heard a number of kind of hypothetical injustices of situations where parents would find themselves criminalised. But surely the strongest evidence is from what has actually happened in those countries uh, which have introduced legislation similar to this, notably Ireland and New Zealand. And there has not been a sudden criminalisation uh, of thousands of parents. We've also uh, heard the concern that the police will be inundated. But again, in those countries, that didn't happen. And we've heard uh, or see in the committee report that both the police and the Crown Office, the police and the Crown Office and their evidence to, to committee did not believe that they would in fact be inundated uh, by reports arising from this change in the legislation. Mr. Mandel talked about the restriction of parental right and rights and discretion and some of his colleagues raised similar issues as well. Uh, and uh, some of them around the, the right to family life. But the fact of the matter is that we already restrict parental rights and discretion. Of course we do. And the fact, no, I'm short of time. And in fact, the right to family life is not an absolute right. Uh, and as a number of people have pointed out, um, the right to family life is not protected to the degree uh, that domestic violence is allowed within the family. It isn't. We consider that to be unacceptable. Uh, because this is not an absolute right, but a qualified uh, right. However, uh, and I do think this is an important point, the minister made the point that she supported the legislation, the government supports the, the bill, because of their desire to make Scotland the best country in which to be a child. Uh, and I think that is a, lo a laudable objective. But I have to say uh, that if we want that be to be true, we should not fool ourselves that passing this bill will achieve that. Only last week, we heard that 240,000 children in our country live in poverty. The Poverty and Inequality Commission talked about the failure of government spending to address that. The IPPR, in a similar report, talked about the importance of fast-tracking the income supplement uh, on which the government is dragging their feet. We should not kid ourselves that by passing this legislation, we resolve everything uh, 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 the, uh, all of the difficulties and challenges that children face uh, in our country today. One or two members have spoken about the last attempt to make a similar change uh, back in 2003, uh, and I was there, of course, at that time. Uh, and I do believe that attitudes have changed significantly since then. Mike Rumble's attitude, for one, but the attitude of the public in Civic Scotland uh, very much so. One or two colleagues have talked about the banning of the belt. When I look at a belt now, I can't believe that a child, when I was a teacher, 
Children as young as my own grandchildren were hit by a toza lokeli, which is a pretty big instrument made of leather. And yet, when that ban came in, people thought that was going to cause all sorts of difficulties, and it didn't. I do think that uh, attitudes change over time. But Ross Greer reminded us that ban only happened because Grace Campbell went to court. We should change this law before we're forced to do it by a court. Thank you, Colin. Liz Smith, to be followed by the Minister Marito. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The political commentators in recent weeks have quite rightly observed that the 20th anniversary of this place affords us the opportunity to examine how well we do things, whether we are delivering effective legislation to improve the lives of those that it is designed to assist. The anniversary, they reflect, is a time to consider what we've got right, what we've got wrong, to examine our parliamentary procedure, procedures and whether our political system is sufficiently robust in terms of passing good le legislation. And I'm very grateful to Christine Graham for what I thought uh, were very interesting remarks uh, about her earlier time in the Parliament, and particularly flagging up what has to be done to make good legislation. She talked about the domestic abuse bill and the facts that had to be put through the Parliament before we agreed to take action. Good legislation, in my view, has to be clear and uncomplicated. It must be based on fairness and maximising the common good. It must be acceptable to the public who must see the legislation as both useful and beneficial. And as far as possible, it should be easily enforceable and not be open to constant debates about repeal. Now, like Margaret Mitchell, I don't doubt for a minute the good intentions of those proposing this bill. But there are many of us in this chamber, and not just on these benches, who have grave reservations about what we have before us because it does not meet the good legislation tests. But also because it has exposed, I won't just now if you, if you don't mind, but also because it has exposed the failings within some aspects of parliamentary procedures, most especially when it comes to the laying of necessary evidence before Parliament. And I'll say more about this later. But can I just say to Fulton McGregor that I think he may wish to revise his remarks, to criticise members of this Parliament because he believes that they haven't taken due process into consideration, I think, quite frankly, is a disgrace. And it undermines what each member, the respect that we have to show to members around this parliament. Now, as Conservative colleagues have argued this afternoon, the fundamental failing of this bill is its single proposal to classify reasonable chastisement as assault. And we've had various members try to argue that these two could be classified in the same way. And I simply don't accept that, neither does the law. But it is also something that is about the unnecessary and unwanted transfer of power away from parents and the family to the state. And we know what the reaction from the vast majority of parents has been for that. Whatever the bill's proponents might like to argue, it will remove parental discretion and create the scope to criminalise their actions if they administer a miles smack. That presiding officer cannot be right and no doubt it explains why so many parents oppose the bill. Nor is there any necessary clarity in this bill because it is devoid of the evidence, including any conclusive evidence from other countries, to prove that the legislation will make children safer. Indeed, the bill is so weak because of the grey areas that it contains, most of them borne out of the completely mistaken view that reasonable chastisement equals assault. For example, are we, really saying, are we really saying that when a parent administers a mild smack to a young child for safety reasons to ensure that he or she does not touch an electric plug, that we will be reported as committing an assault? That is an, that is an open-ended question. And yes, Mr. Mr. Finney, I'm interested, I'm, interested, I'm interested in Mr. Finney's view about that open-ended question, which, as the Crown Office acknowledges, creates both confusion and misunderstanding and an unnecessary additional anxiety to the parent. John Finney. I, I think that the member assumes that uh, the individuals who are daily making decisions uh, about uh, children are going to suddenly suspend all the knowledge they've applied thus far in relation to this. Uh, that's not the case. Does the member, is the member in a position to tell the chamber when she thinks it's appropriate to commence chastising children? At what age is it reasonable to start hitting a child, please? Liz Smith. I, I'm perfectly happy with the current law because I do not believe that anybody anybody at all has provided the necessary evidence to explain what is the, the bad aspect of the current law. 
And I refer back to what Christine Graham uh, said and to what Mr Rumbles uh, said about the uh, original legislation that we took at 2002, 2003, when we debated this issue uh, for, for a long period of time. And can I just quote you um, what, in fact, what uh, Jim Wallace said uh, in that debate as well? That in, uh, my good friend and, and the late David McCletchy made the point that the Scottish Parliament should leave well alone and resist the temptation to interfere and legislate at every turn when it is unnecessary to do so. Jim Wallace, who proposed the bill, accepted that his bill would not introduce any protections who could not reasonably be dealt with by the courts, and the same remains true today. That is the, funda that is the fundamental problem about this bill, Mr Finney. It does not have the evidence that is required to ensure that it, these additional protections would be put in place. There is no evidence. Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. And I have tried to listen as closely as I can to those who uh, don't support this, this bill. It seems to me that there is one question that they've all avoided. If they're right, why is it that the voices of children's rights organisations are so clearly behind this bill? Why is it that so many people who have children's rights and well-being as their professional expertise are supporting this bill uh, and, and only the Conservatives have it right? Liz Smith. No. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr Harvey, have you, have you listened to the opinion polls amongst parents? These are the very people whose actions or the scope of this bill would be made into criminals, potentially. That's the problem. Yes, of course, there are many... There are many uh, charities who have spoken in favour of the bill and I, under, I understand that Mr Harvey but there are many 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 parents across Scotland who have taken the complete opposite view and that tells as much a story as those who support it. Now presiding officer I made my uh, remarks at the beginning about the legacy of this parliament after 20 years about whether we can take pride in passing good legislation. As things stand just now this bill just as was the case with the deeply troubled name person legislation is very wide of the mark indeed about adhering to the key tests which underpin good legislation. Just like the named person legislation, it does not have the support of the public. That is because it, it is not incomparable. That is because it is unnecessary interference and because it is unworkable. But may I say, presiding officer, I'm deeply troubled about this bill because it has exposed some of the fundamental weaknesses in the manner with which the bill has so far been scrutinised. I hope you will agree, presiding officer, that it is wrong, entirely wrong, that stage one debate of this bill is happening prior to some crucial legal opinion being placed before the parliament. As a longer serving member of this parliament, I am frankly astonished that it has been acceptable to proceed to stage one without the Lord Advocate appearing before the committee to answer questions on the bill and also before the point of order that my colleague um, Oliver Mundell raised on the 15th of May has been properly addressed. So that together with some of the fundamental failings in the bill is why I will certainly not be supporting it at the end of today. Thank you and I call Marie Todd, the Minister, before calling John Finney to wind up. Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to members who've contributed to today's debate and I'd like to take the opportunity to address some of the specific points that have been raised. Firstly, criminalisation of parents. In other jurisdictions that have implemented similar legislation, there hasn't been a significant increase in prosecutions. We expect that to be repeated in Scotland. In Ireland and New Zealand, the change in law was similar to that in Mr Finney's bill no, I won't take an intervention. I'm sorry. I have a number of issues which have been raised during the debate which I wish to respond to so there will be limited time for me to take interventions. You had multiple opportunities to intervene in the first time, so I hope to answer all of the issues which have been raised during the debate in my closing speech. In Ireland and New Zealand, the change in law was similar to that in Mr Finney's bill, the removal of a defence. Neither country has seen a significant increase in prosecutions. In New Zealand, the five-year period after the law came into force, there were just eight prosecutions. And in Ireland, the committee heard that the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions has found no evidence of any increase in the number of prosecutions. Of course, the approach in other countries varies. Legal systems and approaches vary. But the point is, 
that physical punishment is wrong. This bill fits the legal system in Scotland. Members have asked, does the bill criminalise smacking? As the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service said to the committee in their supplementary submission, the bill as, criminally, as currently drafted removes a defence to a behaviour which otherwise falls within the scope of common law crime of assault rather than creating a new crime. The practical effect of that would be the state that some acts carried out as physical punishment which may be commonly referred to as smacking would no longer benefit from the defence of reasonable chastisement and would fall to be considered in terms of the law of assault as it applies generally. So what is the approach to prosecutions? Decisions on prosecutions in individual cases are entirely a matter for the Crown Office acting under the direction of the Lord Advocate. Similarly, it is for the Lord Advocate alone to consider whether the guidelines in relation to prosecution will be drafted and published. The Crown Office Prosecution Code sets out the test which prosecutors apply when deciding whether to take prosecutorial action. Richard Lyle raised the issue of unnecessary um, police and Crown Office Pro Procurator Fiscal Service action in trivial cases. The written evidence makes it absolutely clear that professional prosecution will, as now, follow the Scottish Prosecution Code. Firstly, prosecutors must establish... Can I please address the issues which were raised during the debate? Continue, Mr. Really? Thank you. Firstly, prosecutors must establish if any report received discloses a crime known to the law of Scotland. Secondly, prosecutors assess whether there is sufficient, admissible, credible and reliable evidence that the offence was committed and, it was, and that it was the accused person who committed it. Finally, prosecutors consider what action, if any, best serves the public at, at, interest. In doing so, the Crown Office takes into account a range of applicable criteria, such as the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim, the personal circumstances of the accused, the attitude of the victim, the age of the offence, any mitigating circumstances, the effect of a prosecution on the accused, the risk of further offending, and considerations relating to the public concern. The Scottish Government considers that the main aim of this bill is to make it clear that physical punishment of children is wrong rather than the criminalisation of parents. In terms of clarity in the law, as Rona Mackay said, the committee heard that in Ireland different civil society organisations and state agencies are positive about the clarity that was brought by the change in the law and social workers have better relationships with parents because they can provide clear advice. That doesn't fit with the spectre being raised of a huge number of increased concerns and an overburdened people responding to um, minor issues. That echoed the evidence the committee received from Social Work Scotland, from Bernardo Scotland, with the NSPCC and Children First and the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, Parenting Across Scotland and the Law Society of Scotland. There is broad and broad civic support for this change in legislation. All of those people agreed that this bill will bring clarity to the law. As a number of contributors, including Rhoda Grant, have said, it removes the judgment around how does my reasonableness compare with others. It sends a clear message that physical punishment of children is unacceptable and a clear message to society that clarifies the law. As the Crown Office put it, the common law crime of assault is well understood and it's widely used to prosecute offending in courts across Scotland, resulting in a large number of convictions each year. The Crown Office added, the bill proposes to remove this defence, which means that the legal situation would be simplified and children would receive the same protection from assault as adults. Gordon Lindhurst said that the Lord Advocate had not given evidence. I have to correct that because the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service gave detailed written evidence to the committee. Gordon Lindhurst also said that the bill tells parents how to parent. It doesn't. It makes it absolutely clear that parents will still have a range of positive techniques at their disposal when, when disciplining their children. On the issue of interference with family life, 
we are not aware of any international treaty provision which gives the rights to parents to physically punish their children. And we note that the committee came to the same conclusion in paragraph 95 of its stage one report. Murdo Fraser asked, I think, why physical punishment of children was different from all the other forms of discipline which might be used, like the removal of privilege or the naughty step. Let me be clear, the difference is that there is a solid body of evidence that physical punishment is harmful. Let me remind you that this bill is supported by the Faculty of Public Health, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. There's even a statement opposing physical punishment from the Academy of Pediatrics in America. Let me re read to you the evidence submitted by the Royal College of General Practitioners during the course of the Welsh Bill passing through their Parliament. The balance of evidence seems sufficiently clear and compelling to inform us that parental use of physical punishment of children plays no useful role in their upbringing and poses only risks to their development. Now that's the Royal College of General Practitioners, scientists who are used to assessing the quality of evidence available to them and Actually, coming, if up the, if the would conclude, please. With, coming up with advice to the people that they serve. I'd like to thank the committee again for its consideration of this bill and for Mr. Finney, to Mr. Finney for taking it forward. I urge members to support the general principles of this bill. Thank you. Anna Collin and John Finney to conclude this debate. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. Indeed, thank you very much to all the members who have participated in uh, what's been a, a very interesting debate. It starts off by the convener of the committee talking about the ambitious programme of engagement that took place, and uh, I had forgotten about the snowstorm in Sky, and it's commendable the efforts that people went to share their views with us. Uh, more and thank to uh, all the, the kids at Boonskull uh, Gaelic Post 3. Um, and the, the committee talked about a rights-based approach um, and um, that the, the deliberations were about children being at the core and we forget at our peril that that's what this is about. There was also early mention from the convener of a conflict of rights, but a very clear statement that physical punishment does not, physical punishment of children does not interfere with the rights to family life. Um, hold your children, keep them safe, I think was a very good uh, phrase from that contribution. And the, the, the minister followed that on by again citing the evidence as she, she has there and talked about the work, that, the work that the Scottish Government is doing to make Scotland the best place for children to grow up and that reasonable chastisements antiquated and at odds with that aim. And I certainly would uh, share that view and share the view that the minister expressed that there should be the same legal protection for all individuals, regardless of their size. Now, there was much speculation about the public interest test, and I did, on occasions, try to in intervene. I have to tell you, there's very little mystery about it. Indeed, it's covered in the explanatory notice, a lot of the points that were raised. And the, at page, uh, paragraph 13 on page three, um, the bullet point six, or the, 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 the footnote six, actually gives you a link to the web link that would explain all the factors that are taken into to place. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to change in relation to that. <laughs> Now, the next contribution came from uh, my a good uh, friend and colleague, Mary, uh, Mary Fee, who I thought made, a, 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 as ever, a, an excellent speech and uh, citing the example of uh, learning disability adults um, not, uh, and the public reaction to, to, to that if they were to be subjected to, to being assaulted. But very clear statement, assault is assault. That's unequivocal. And I thought another very important point that, that uh, um, Mary Fee made was that the Parliament is a guarantor of human rights, and that's absolutely. And there is an imbalance at the moment, as she rightly identified with this, and it will be part of a cultural change. My colleague Ross Greer then went on uh, to give a very comprehensive resume of the rights and the shortcomings that exist at the moment. And these are acknowledged by the Scottish Government. Indeed, they were acknowledged by the Equality and Human Rights Committee, who commended the approach of the adoption and cooperation of the the UN uh, co Convention. And, and I would share my, my colleague Ross Greer's view that the Human Rights Advisory Group's findings must be acted upon. You just don't hit children, I think, is a very good statement. And I think uh, uh, Ross was, was uh, brave to talk about personal faith, and, and, and I do appreciate the faith groups that have had a contribution to this, and particularly grateful to, obviously, those that lent their support to the legislation. And uh, that's not least the uh, 
the, the Quakers and the, the, the Church of Scotland. Um, and we are rights holders in here and we need to do that. Next speaker was um, uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton and I would like to acknowledge his, his support throughout this and the, the advice he's, he's very generously shared with me and his long-standing commitment to this cause that predates a lot of us. I've, uh, his father's face is in my thoughts at the moment given the retribution he, he took in his, his father but um, he's quite right to say that there's an international uh, uh, imperative and it was the first mention or uh, substantive mention of the police and chief superintendent Mackenzie who came and gave evidence what I thought was very compelling evidence of explaining along with his colleagues sitting side beside him from social work saying what happens at the moment, the shared work that goes, takes place, the interest of the child being at the forefront of deliberations, the public interest being a factor, and that nothing would change. If anything happened, there'd be great, greater clarity provided. So no right to hit was a, a comment that Mr. Cole Hamilton made there. Angela Constance, again, I, 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 and I'm not going to have time to do everything, but a, a, another excellent speech there. And yes, I was a police officer, and that might surprise people, but um, and I, I was struck as, as a child, and I, I struck my children. And I think we are all the richer if we learn from experiences. And that's what it is. The unfolding evidence is irrefutable of the damage. And the phrase never harmed me. Uh, yes, I will. Liam Kerr. I'm grateful to the member taking the intervention. My colleague Liz, Liz Smith raised some really quite important procedural points. I'm just wondering if the member can come back on the points that Liz Smith raised. John Finney. Well, if this is about um, accusations and what would happen, nothing that would happen this differently. Liam Kerr. Oh, um, yeah. I, I don't John feel, Finney. Mr. Sorry. Brilliant. I don't feel it's for me to comment. The, the views have been shared with the presiding officer. Certainly, unlike some members, I attended every session of evidence and um, I, I thought we heard very compelling evidence and comprehensive evidence. I didn't hear any attempt to stop hearing evidence. There was no, uh, and there was a, a significant number of written submissions as well, of course. I th yes, indeed. Hamilton. Just to clarify, um, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. The committee went to great lengths to encourage representations from groups opposed to this legislation, as it did from the key members of the judiciary already described in the Crown Office and the Lord Advocate, both of whom submitted written evidence. I agree with the member that evidence we received was full, as comprehensive as it could be. John Finney. Um, I, thank, I thank the member for that, that intervention. Um, the... Um, Annie Wells talked about legal clarity, um, uh, but, but I, I have to say it wasn't apparent to me, certainly uh, she wasn't at all the sessions I was at, that she'd taken on board all the information that was there. Rona Mackay was the next speaker um, who talked about learned behaviour, which I thought was a significant factor. Um, Rhoda Grant, um, and perhaps you can tell me how long I have, presiding officer, please. I'll give another two minutes, Mr. Finney. <laughs> Thank you much indeed. Okay. Thank you. Um, likewise, uh, Rhoda Grant, I thought, had a very powerful speech um, and talked about verbal assault there. And uh, we know we have checks and balances in our system and the reassurance there is there. Gail Ross, the incorporation of rights, baby box, the direction of travel. Uh, I have to say, Mr Lindhurst, who wouldn't take an intervention, clearly the uh, Tories aspirant legal shock jock um, was, uh, um, I think, way off the mark there. Um, uh, it's, uh, Claire, Claire Baker talked about being convinced that children need um, equal protection and talked about the work of Mr Barry in, in an earlier session, and that's to be commended, and the unfinished business. And that's how I see it. There were uh, uh, excellent contributions again from um, James Dorn, and, and I'm grateful to my colleague Mike, Mike Rumbles. I thought a very courageous thing to say that you've changed your, your mind uh, on the basis of ever evidence that's been received. And that evidence has been overwhelming. And the evidence suggests that um, physical punishment of children is ineffective. It has potential long-term effect. We know young people support this change. The practitioners, the police, the social work, health professionals, regal professionals, the children's charities support it. We members from all five parties in the chamber support it. It's time to give children equal protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on the stage one of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. We move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 17432 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme. And could I ask uh, Maurice Golden to move this motion? Moved. Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on this motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 17432 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. 
So we turn to decision time and there's one question this evening. The question is that motion 17342 in the name of John Finney on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17342 in the name of John Finney is yes, 80, no, 29. There were two abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And, and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Mary Fee on Sam H. report on universal credit and mental health. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. A few moments and then we'll proceed. <laughs>